you talked about one of your things you wish you had done earlier was networking. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I know we just touched on it a moment ago as far as collective genius, but you know, if you were to start all over again, you would start networking earlier. Yeah. So for those that are listening right now that aren't networking, what would you say to them? Somebody says like, Hey, how do I go about that? It's like, I, I feel like I need money to invest. And it's like, no, you don't need money to invest. You need creativity, you need knowledge, and you need a network. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today, we got Jack Bosch with Land Profit Generator. Uh, and Jack is another local expert in the Phoenix community, but he does do deals all over the country. And today, we're going to be talking about how to do over $70,000 a month in passive income. Now, I am on a mission to create 100 millionaires. The information on this podcast alone is enough to help you become a millionaire in the next five to seven years. If you'll take consistent action, you'll become one. And even paying attention to some of the stuff we put, we've been putting out there, you'll know that we're launching something big a week from today. So if you want lifetime access to what we're launching, I would suggest you go to salesdisruptors.com for now. Our 50% off promotion, 50% off promotion ends on May 14th. Uh, and if you get value out of the show, please... Hit that subscribe button right now, please. We want to help as many people as possible uh, so that way we can all grow together. And this is a live show, so please ask your questions for Jack to answer. You ready? I'm ready. All right, cool. It's been, I was looking at this, four years. Oh, wow. This is the last time you were on the show. So four. last week marked the fifth year that we've been doing this show. So you came around. Year one. Year one. Yeah, wow. It's been, so it's been yeah, well, quite I- some time. What an evolution too. You had yeah. like some rented space on there yeah. with like in this black kind of office. Now look at that. We got the fancy office, the fancy studio. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. So question where I like we always like to start off with is what was your life like right before real estate? What was my life like before real estate? I had a job at a software implementation consult software company and in their implementation branch. I was traveling hundred percent of the time, Monday to Friday. I was sometimes even the weekends. I was working. We, we used to joke that by Wednesday night we had forty hours, and I hated every part of it. Sounds like a dark joke. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, we worked from about nine in the morning till about ten, eleven o'clock at night, and so that's fourteen hours. Mm-hmm. And uh, fourteen by by day three, you're at the thirty-six kind of hours. Sometimes even midnight and. So by Wednesday, Thursday, we had the 40 hours. By Friday, we're like at 60 hours. And, and, um, and I hated it. I had two weeks vacation, 100% travel, meaning that uh, I was just a newly, uh, well, I was, uh, had this girlfriend mm-hmm. and then became my fiance. Now she's, and now then I married her. And, and now we're married 22 years, Michelle, obviously you know her. And we love being uh, hanging out together. And, uh, and we couldn't. I mean, I was like, I was gone all the time. Was, I was miserable. She was miserable. And it was just not a, a, a kind of environment we wanted to be in. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, you talk about you came from Germany. Mm-hmm. What was it that brought you uh, from Germany to, to the United States? So I was a college student, and I loved the college life. I enjoyed that quite a bit, mm-hmm. longer than I probably should have. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in Germany, also the system back in the days was different. It, it took about five years, five to six years to graduate from a full, but basically with the equivalent of a master's here. And um, and I was very close to that. I had two more huge, amount, huge, really difficult exams in front of me. And then I realized that if I, that there wasn't, there's a way out of those. So, you know, as entrepreneurs, we kind of like, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur at that time. Now I know, of course, but uh, I was trying to figure out a way out of those, out of those two exams. Mm-hmm. And I realized that, they were, that this university had exchange programs with, uh, with different countries, including the United States. Mm-hmm. And so I applied for it. I got accepted. And I, the plan was to spend 10 months, two semesters in the U.S., take a bunch of classes that would give me credit for those same ba- for those two big exams over there. At the same time, improve my English, and as a side effect, I would get an American MBA because mm-hmm. I was already studying business, so I got uh, credit over there too. So it was kind of like three things in one. I yeah. was like, okay, let's do that. Never did I count. Had never been to the U.S. Never really had a desire to be in the U.S. Didn't know why not. Not not anything. I I didn't have anything against the U.S. Mm-hmm. I just. I was more like a European traveler, right? I mm. went to the beaches of this of Europe and so on. And then I came to the US and I fell in love with the US. And then also a few weeks into being here, I met this young lady who is now 
my wife for 22 years mm -hmm. and that changed everything. So then we just never came back. Gotcha. Um, so you got your MBA, mm -hmm. Western Illinois University. Yes. Right? Yes. You don't have to put your, I mean, it, Go you still have an MBA. No, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a solid, it's a good school. Mm -hmm. It's an accredited school. I did not particularly enjoy my time there other than, of course, having met Michelle. So I, I, we always joke, it's like, there was a reason why I went to the middle of the cornfields, five hours away from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And and to I, I'm from a small town in Germany. I never wanted to ever live in a small town again. And now there we go, a land in Macomb, Illinois. It's like this is like my hometown all over, just in American. Mm -hmm. Like it's like literally reminded me of Back to the Future, like the square and the church and the courthouse in the middle and the the clock on top, identical. Really. And uh, so it's like I never want to be there ever again. And now we're stuck there for a year, but uh, it's a good school. I mean, I, I learned a lot. I I. I Oh, I, I guess my what degree I wanted and, to and, ask you is how, meant to be there. how much did that MBA help you in this business journey? So I'm, I, I love bashing colleges now. I love talking about that really um, there's no reason for now In today's world, if you want to be an entrepreneur, there's no reason to go to college. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that's, every time I say that, a part of me feels like that is the truth and a part of me feels like this is not 100% the truth because you do learn a lot of things in college. Yeah. You do learn how to approach problems. You have to do a lot of self-sufficient project work and figure things out and do presentations and things like that, particularly in American colleges. Germany is much more academic. You have just like study something, read something, memorize it, produce it, right? Mm -hmm. it's much more school kind of uh, like middle school level, even though it's very, very hard and the academic standards are very, very high. U.S. is much more hands-on and you actually, I think you walk away with some life skills. Right, some so that was definitely some application to it. And then studying business in particularly, there is definitely benefits to learning things like accounting. Mm -hmm. Like I had accounting classes. So it's beneficial to walk into, to start a business and at least on a fundamental basis, understand what's the difference between an asset and a liability. What's the difference between a P&L, a cash flow statement and a, and a balance sheet and, and those kind of things. But again, do you have to go for four year, or in my case, a seven year degree to to actually because I went to college for seven years that, that's a different story. Uh, I like to party uh, I, back then. Now I'm 52. I don't party anymore. I go sure. to sleep at 9 p.m. But uh, but do you have to go for a four year degree to learn that? No. Nowadays there's iTunes U. There is uh, podcasts. There is there's everything is at your fingertips. You you can learn that same thing from the, some of the top institutions in a Three week audio course. Or you can look at like I think a lot of the Stanford and Harvard classes are available for free yeah, online. Exactly. Right? Like someone's paying forty thousand yeah. a semester. Yeah. You don't get the degree, but you get the knowledge. You don't, you get don't the have get the network either, which I, I told my daughter, my daughter is fifteen right now. She's graduating from uh, she's she's a freshman in high school uh, right now. I told her, You're going to college and she wants to go to the to an Ivy League school, but I made it very clear. Sophia, you're going to college for two reasons. Number one, network. Number two, to have fun. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to learn a bunch of stuff anyway, right? You know, right. she's not going to suck. She's a, she's a great student. She's in all, all A's, all advanced honor kind of classes. But she's going to be naturally learning a bunch of stuff. But you really, you're not going to learn a profession. You're not going to learn the skills to then become an entrepreneur. You learn... You go to to Harvard or anything if he makes it there or some one of these Ivy League schools or any school. You learn there. You go there. Number one for for to have fun and number two to to really learn uh, network with people. What if and she then says, stay with those. What if she says, Dad, I don't want to go to go to college. Totally fine with me too. Totally fine with you too. Hundred percent. As a matter yeah. of fact, she's in our land flipping coaching program right now. Last night we sent. I helped her send out their first letters. To get uh, to get leads uh, to to find some land, so yeah. she she wants to make six figures as a as a uh, sophomore in high school. Yeah. So there's a good chance she actually might not go to college because if she makes whatever a few hundred thousand dollars by senior year or like as a sophomore, junior, senior, why in the world would she go to college? And yeah. if she already makes more than than some of the top graduates from the top schools or the professors, oh, um, oh, for sure the professors. Yeah. <laughs> so. My daughter asked me yesterday over dinner, she's like, Dad, can I start an online business? I was like, yeah, yes, you can. What kind of question is this, right? And she's 12, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but I think, you know, we're going to have some tough conversations uh, in, when she's 18 and has to decide, 
which college she wants to go to. And I'm kind of like you. I went to school. I got my master's degree. I do not look as fondly upon college as I did when yeah. I went to college. So that'll be interesting. So, all right. That was your life before real estate. Why did you get into real estate? We developed over time a decision filter. Again, analytical, German. Michelle is just as analytical as I am. We basically said like, hey, let's not jump into just the first thing that comes our way. Let's, let's look at our situation that we are in. And the situation that we were in back then was we were immigrants. We, work on a, we were on an H-1B visa. And an H-1B visa is a visa that's tied to a company. So you cannot just quit. If you quit, you lose your, uh, you lose your work visa. So then you have 60 days to either find another job or leave the country. So number one, and my job was 100% travel. So I was like, let's look for something that we can do part-time because I couldn't quit. Number two, that, I can, that, that, I, that is something that I don't have to physically supervise every day because you can do a part-time business running a gym at night or working at a gym or a second job or something. You work in an office all day long, and you get in the car and you go to your second nighttime job or so. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't an option because I was four weeks here, six weeks over there, three months over there, two weeks over there. There's no way that you can oh, yeah. do so anything. there were additional so, restrictions with the travel. Yeah, there was, there was travel. Uh, there's exactly huge restrictions around it. So it needed to be something that, that can be done 100% virtual. Like we thought about first, initially we thought about the ideas like, uh, and to this day, I think it's still a good idea. We just came from back, back from Europe and man, Europe has such amazing bread. Right? The bread is just out of this world, the sweets, the thing, the pastries, everything. I still to this day haven't found many places in the U.S. that offer that same quality of, of bread. Now, the coffee is really? there yet. Like 30 years ago, 25 years ago, coffee was crappy most everywhere. It was like, like dirty water, right? Hot, dirty water. Now with Starbucks and things, you get amazing coffee everywhere. Mm -hmm. And with a second tier, with all these local kind of coffee, uh, the coffee roasteries and so on, there's amazing coffee in the U.S., well, bread hasn't caught up yet. Caught up yet. It's mm -hmm. still like sandwich bread and things. It's just not the same. Sure. So it was like, let's start a bakery. Well, decision filter. It can't be done part time. It can't be done remote, uh, location independent. Uh, I'm not a morning person. I don't want to get up at two in the morning and bake bread and et cetera, et cetera. Plus, we had no capital to even buy anything. So through those things, we eliminated one business idea after the other until we stumbled through an infomercial, I actually watched Ron LeGrand infomercial back in the day, and now Ron is a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. um, and I, we came across real estate because it sounded doable at least. It sounded like, okay, you put something under contract, you perhaps you flip it, you wholesale it, uh, we can potentially do that. And that was the start. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, we failed a bunch of times, because we didn't know anything about real estate, so we didn't know how to how to estimate repairs. We didn't know how much it costs to rehab a kitchen, how much it costs to rehab a bathroom, uh, how to much repair a roof, fix a foundation issue, fix electric. I mean, we didn't even know the language of real estate. Like we didn't know what what I what what drywall is. Even first time is like, yeah, well, you need to replace the drywall. It's like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Me write it down. What what the heck is drywall? Uh, the other day when we moved, a few years ago, we moved from our old home to our home where we live now, and uh, I found a bunch of like a bunch of the original, very first real estate books that I looked through, and I looked through them, and I saw they were still highlighted stuff, and I saw the kind of terms and things I highlighted. That blows my mind. The most basic real estate terms mm -hmm. I highlighted and I wrote up and decide what that means and things like that. Because yeah. we're just learning the absolute basics, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and after that, we we got a deal on it. We did driving for dollars. We learned about that. We drove around, found, boarded up houses, went down to the city or county, figured out what the, what they're worth, and and then contacted the person. We got a deal on a contract. Mm -hmm. But everything was wrong about it. I mean, the value was wrong. The repairs were wrong. Was it all in, was it Macomb? In Phoenix. Oh, no, this, that was in Phoenix. Now, we were already living in Phoenix okay. at the time. We only lived after being in Western Illinois for one year. We lived in Chicago for a year. And then Michelle actually wanted to do her master's mm -hmm. at a very good school here in town, Thunderbird, uh, American Graduate School for International Management. And I was able to move with a company I had my job for, job with down here because they had offices everywhere. Mm -hmm. They basically said, I don't care where you live as long as you live close to an airport because you're going to yeah, go travel anyway. As long as you're willing to jump on a plane. Yeah, exactly. So we were able to move down here 
And, um, and that's where we started. So we found a place in the Garfield district, if you know, downtown Phoenix, yeah. and it was a mess. And so we couldn't sell it. Nobody would buy it. We got a ton of calls on it. We had to back out of the deal. Then we looked into the next thing is we had just read Rich Dad Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. Robert Kiyosaki had been a guest teacher at Thunderbird, and he hired a few of Michelle's friends in college to create a marketing plan for the rollout of his book for him. Really? And wow. so we went one, day, one night, we hung out at one of her college friends' place, and he gives me the book and he says, like, read this book. And that changed a lot because obviously, like everyone read Rich Dad Poor Dad, made a big, in, big impact. And so we, I read the book. It was fantastic. And somewhere in the book, he talks about talking to his neighbor. And he says, like, yeah, and I'm making 16% of my money with tax lien certificates. I'd never even heard the term tax lien certificate. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what that was. So I researched that. And I found that. And I found tax liens and tax deeds. And... And through that process, we bought some liens and bought some, and, and, and they were redeemed right away. It didn't make any money. Then we bought, then we sent with our, with all the money we had, a few thousand dollars, we sent Michelle to California to attend a tax deed auction. And she was outbid left and right immediately. So we failed on that too. But then we had a thought that we ultimately says, you know what, if these people don't pay their property taxes and they really absolutely, that blew our minds. If they so much don't want their properties that they even stop paying property taxes, what if we contact them? Because if we contact them now, perhaps somebody who just stopped paying property taxes last week or last month, they made up their mind they don't want this thing anymore. Yeah. What if we contact them right now? We could be ahead of all the competition and so on. Not get outbid. Not get outbid and so on. Instead, get a deal because they don't want it anymore. They're willing to take like a few pennies on a dollar for it. And then we contacted, we did that. We got to the county. Nobody was selling that data. Now you can get tax delinquent data from multiple sources. Back then, there was, nobody was selling it. So we went into the, we had literally had to go down to the county and find out what that is and, and go and talk to the people and get like sometimes a cartridge given to us. Mm -hmm. Then we had to find somebody who can process that cartridge and produce it into an Excel spreadsheet. It wasn't what a lot of like- It wasn't logging in the prop stream. No, it wasn't logging into prop stream or <laughs> any other thing or CoreLogic or anything of these things. <laughs> Little, none of that. And, and, but ultimately we got it done and then we sent out these letters and only people who owned land would, 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 would contact us. Mm -hmm. Like all the house, the house owners wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't call us back. So you still hadn't figured out a land was a no. strategy yet? No, no. Okay, no, so no, you're, just, you're just doing tax. We're now two and a half years into this, zero success, like, but desperate because we still hate it. We still, our green card hadn't still arrived. Still hate your job. Still in our day job, still dependent on the visa. Nothing had happened yet. And we're like, but we knew like there's something to that. There's somewhere in the realm of real estate, there, there's the answer for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then you realize only people that didn't have houses replied back to you. Yes. And that's when you had the epiphany. Well, it wasn't an epiphany. It was more like, what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. Well, the good news is we're like, hey, okay, first of all, there's no house on it, so we, we can't screw up again on estimating repairs. Yes. What, let's figure out, try to figure out what the thing is worth. So we called a few realtors in the area, and they're like, well, based on our data, we can tell that, that properties in that area sold for like $8,000 in the past. We're like, okay, so it's worth eight grand. But then we're like, well, I don't know if we can sell it for eight. I don't know if we can sell it for six or four if we need to make some money. And this guy said on the phone, he said he just doesn't want it anymore. He went to a divorce. He, he doesn't care about it. He was initially had planned to build a house there. Now he just wants to get rid of it. And he wants to move away, wants to have a clean slate. We're like, well, he's motivated. Mm -hmm. let's, let's be extra conservative and extra careful. Let's offer him like 400 bucks for it. And he took it. Mm -hmm. And then we went there, put a sign on the property, and the neighbor came across from across the street and right on the spot offered us 4000 for it. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay, well, we figured something out now. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that because we didn't have to estimate repairs. We didn't have to estimate uh, foundation issues or anything. We, didn't even, we hadn't even seen the property. We're just like, okay, we figured out the valuation part. Mm -hmm. Based on that, we made an offer, got it accepted, put a sign on it, the neighbor walks over, wants it, do a closing, made $3,600. We're like, well, that's about what I made in my job every month. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I just made a month worth of salary by sending out a couple of hundred letters and doing a few phone calls. Yeah. I can do that again. And I don't really need to know anything about real estate at that point because I didn't need to figure out its development potential. Uh, we're not, none of that. We don't deal in development mm -hmm. land. We just, we just wholesale it, flip it. 
and 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 then now so and, and also added seller financing at some point of time so four hundred dollars you took it is that more or less than a tax bill the four hundred dollars included about two hundred dollars in back taxes mm-hmm. so the guy netted two hundred bucks at the gotcha. end of the day okay that's fascinating so you eventually you kind of find the direction yeah you just kept going 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 so there's then after things- that from that same mailing another deal came out and we made ninety five hundred dollars of mm-hmm. that one we're like well let's do that again we grabbed another tax delinquent list and sent out some more letters got another few deals done and soon enough we're like you know what screw houses forget about houses we're not we're no longer even focusing on houses we're just going for land because we don't have to know we still didn't know anything about real estate mm-hmm. we didn't, still didn't know anything about anything having to do with buildings uh, not, didn't know the terminology, but we had done real estate deals. So this is really the, real, the way to do real estate deals without knowing much about real estate. That's how we saw it. So we started yeah. doing deals, and we just put the blinders on and did it. And well, then we know. also soon realized that tax delinquent is, is limiting us to like only 3% of all the deals we can do. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, we don't focus on tax delinquent or real estate anymore. It was just our beginning because that's how we saw that there's people who really want to give up their properties for nothing. Mm-hmm. And that blew our minds. But... There's, ju- there's 20 times, 50 times as many people out there. They still grudgingly pay property taxes, but they also want to get rid of this piece of land because time and circumstances have changed or they inherited it or so on. Yeah, well, and I think that you're talking about the, um, you didn't know anything about real estate. This is great for people that don't, don't know real estate. And the reality is you were just really good at marketing and analyzing yeah. the data, right? This works, this doesn't work. Hey, this worked, let's do more of that. Yeah. Which is really what marketing comes down to. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And it's about marketing on the on the on the acquisition side. So we we then our first letter got us a very low response rate. Mm-hmm. So then we tweaked the letters. We started split testing the letters. We started sending out, let's say, a thousand letters with version A, a thousand letters with version B. And then we realized version A got us three percentage point higher response rate than the other one. And then so we screw this one and we forget this one and then we use this one and we test it again and again and again until we develop the letter that we, to this day, haven't been able to, to beat yet. Yeah. And, um, and, and so on. And then the same with like areas. You, you, you make mistakes. I mean, we, one of the areas we like focusing on is, is areas that are like perhaps about a half an hour to an hour outside of bigger cities because mm-hmm. prices are way lower. But it's still feasible for somebody to live there, particularly in today's world where half of the United States almost still works from home. Mm-hmm. It's feasible to live there. And if you need to go into the office, you're willing to drive an extra hour once a week or twice a week, but still now have, uh, be able to live in the forest or live in the woods with, with like on five acres or 10 acres and, and have a horse and have a barn and have kind of like, there's a lot of people who want that. I'm not, yeah. I'm a city person. I don't want that. Like I was, <laughs> as thus I was dying in western illinois university yeah. because i was living in rural rural america and it's like it's not what i want to do so. but but we make mistakes so one time we did that not knowing where we picked a city like san francisco and we said like, okay let's go an hour outside of that and we picked sonoma county well little did we know that sonoma county is obviously big wine country and back then i knew nothing about wine now i love wine but uh but they knew nothing that the acres were selling for half a million dollars a million dollars an acre and probably more now so sometimes you make mistakes and you go kind of to the wrong areas, but over time you get better and better, and better at, at selecting the well, markets and, you go after. And that's what marketing is, right? Just getting better and better, figure out what works, what doesn't work. Exactly right. So there's a few things you mentioned there. So Ron the Grand, and you learned about wholesaling. Yeah. When you learned about it 20 something years ago, though, what was that called? It wasn't called wholesaling. Quick, or, fi- quick flip, I think you called it. I think yeah. that's what his name. Yeah, he wrote using... a book then that we actually are testimonial in it because we, use, we didn't use any of his method, but he taught us the terminology. Mm-hmm. And we had found a separate deal outside, actually one of the tax auctions. Before we developed our method, we had done one deal. And that was at a tax auction where Michelle went to. She made friends with a lady that actually had one of her properties gone to ta- let, let that property go to tax auction because in states like California, if they sell for more than what was owed in taxes, the former owner gets the overage. Excess proceeds, yeah. The excess proceeds. So she was there to collect the excess proceeds. And Michelle made friends with her, but she had another deal. And we got that deal for $70,000, which we didn't have. Mm-hmm. And we wholesaled it, wholesaled it to somebody else for $105,000. And after closing costs, we made $32,000 on that mm-hmm. deal. That was our, really our seed money to then... 
put stuff in place. But but that was a coincidental deal, not using our marketing strategy, but we used Ron Grant's documents for that. They came literally the, the day before I needed to go to to San Francisco to to meet with a lady and have her sign that agreement. We got the we got a document. So I'm eternally grateful for Ron for providing that to me. Mm -hmm. But then afterwards we developed our own program. Yeah. And the reason why I'm asking these questions is because, you know, one of the things we're going to be talking about later on is you've been around for some time. Right? Yeah. Like you you say you're friends with, you know, like Ron the Grand, connected with Kiyosaki and this and that. So I wanna share some of these older yeah <laughs> what it used to be like you know the in the old times yeah i mean there's now we teach this you teach this uh, you have, we have programs we have, i've been in a room and credit where credit is due i've been in a room with like a hundred educators including ronald grant and somebody asked the question who in this room got their way got got one or the other way influenced or started by ronald grant and like 60 percent of the hands went up mm -hmm. so if you have not heard of ronald grant then make sure you you, you look him up. He's still active. He's in his 70s now. He, he will, in his life, he forgot more about real estate than I will ever learn. Yeah, and he did share some important lessons. Um, yeah. You know, he's in, we're a mastermind with him. Yeah. And the things he shared is like, wow, okay, make sure we don't make that mistake down the road. Right. Um, yeah. And then you mentioned, you know, you were uh, associated somewhat in some way with Robert Kiyosaki. So I had a chance to meet with him a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, my experience with him is that he's pretty hot tempered yes uh, has that always been the case or is that like a newer? yes i've seen him present that present like when when he gave his name to one of the real estate coaching companies were called rich dad education mm -hmm. they did their seminars and they usually invited me on a saturday night to give an extra presentation at night mm -hmm. about land flipping because that's not something that that they were teaching in their university and their and and sometimes i was there doing the events and i came a day earlier so and then there was robert was there also teaching and yeah, I mean, he's not only hot tempered, he's pretty foul mouthed. And uh, mm -hmm. like uh, the F word is like as often as used as we use the word and. And um, <laughs> and so the, um, but he's also a smart guy. I mean, he's super very, very smart, super, super sharp. sharp. Yeah. He, he is definitely a doomsday more person. He expects the world to come to an end. Mm -hmm. And he's been preaching that for like now 20 years now, but he's not always been wrong. He's been occasionally been right. So yeah, well, and yeah. I don't think, if you look back, right, like I don't think anyone's changed more lives. Yeah. For the entrepreneur world. Yeah. Especially than, in the real estate side yeah, of things. Yeah. Than, himself. Than, than he did. Yeah. And then you mentioned somewhere along the way we were doing your journey. And this is, I know it's like a total like side, sideways thing here, but like, you know, you mentioned tax liens. And yeah. so tax liens seems to be one of those things that's always popular. It's always like, oh, that's really cool. But I don't know, but just a handful of people. That do really well on tax liens, and those that do really well on tax liens is because they've got a stupid amount of money. Yeah, it's like playing the craps game. Yeah, but you can afford to put your chips on everything. Yes, is that been your experience with tax liens? Hundred well? percent. Yeah. So uh, tax liens. The the facts about tax liens is the reason why it's popular, and even with educators that teach it, is because it gives the average students a success moment very quickly. Mm -hmm. Like. You go to an auction, you bid on something, you get the tax lien, and, oh my God, now I'm a real estate investor. Well, no, you're not. You just bought a lien on something. You're a financial investor. It's no different than buying a stock certificate, mm -hmm. only with the difference that they can get the stock certificate back from you at any time and pay you pittance for it. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm not a fan of stack tax liens. But I've actually, I probably in my life, I bought not many tax liens. Now, I studied tax liens left and right, but... Me I'm too. a much bigger fan of tax deeds because mm -hmm. at the tax deed auction, you actually get to participate at an auction for the actual real estate. What happens in the tax lien world instead, and for anyone who doesn't know that, like the tax liens is like you you buy, somebody hasn't paid their property taxes, and the state has two different options. And usually it's it's regulated on the state statute level. Very few, very few uh, states like Nevada, for example, they, they give each county the choice, but they're all chosen tax deeds in mm -hmm. that case. But either they, they basically say, the, state, the county says, uh, or the state says, hey, we want our money. And therefore, what they're doing is they're taking the, uh, the amount, if somebody has, owes $1,000 in property taxes and they haven't paid it, they basically they put, they put a lien on it and they sell that lien at a public auction. Mm -hmm. So what you're basically buying is a piece of paper that says, I paid the taxes for this person. And whenever that person, whenever the property changes hands, I'll get paid off. Or whenever they pay it off, I get paid off with a, with a nice interest rate. 
Or if they don't pay that off over the next X years, and it state, varies by state, then I, as a lien holder, can foreclose on that property. And that's what's being advertised, the, 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 the possibility of foreclosure. Oh, my God, I can, get, I can buy a $1,000 tax lien, mm -hmm. and perhaps next year's tax lien, and the following years, I have $3,000 in it. And with that, I can now foreclose on a $100,000 property. Oh, my God, that's the best thing ever. Well, the reality is 99% of these tax liens are getting redeemed. So it's in, more than 99%. It's like 99.99. Yeah, or it's, no, it's, it's, it's more like 99 or 99 point something. But yeah, but it's the vast majority. Almost mm. all of them get redeemed. Right. So what happens is the you can be successful by either focusing on tax liens on land again, because mm -hmm. the land properties often, again, those are the only people that call us back because they don't want this property anymore. Right. So there's a higher likelihood that, they're, that they go all the way to foreclosure. But higher likelihood doesn't mean... It's it flip flops. It's instead of ninety nine percent, it's now ninety five percent. So in essence, you still need to buy a hundred liens in order to foreclose on five. Right. And if you pay a hundred liens at a thousand a pop, you got to invest a hundred grand. Yeah. To then eventually foreclose on five of them, that then make you a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And that was our problem. We had five thousand dollars to our name. Yeah. We didn't have five. Uh, we didn't have a hundred thousand dollars to our yeah, name. Yeah, you need to have a lot. So, of and money. then on top of it, you have to wait sometimes up to three years before you can even start that foreclosure process. Yeah. And then the foreclosure process costs money too, mm -hmm. right? So, so you need hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to really long term be successful on the foreclosure side of tax liens. Now, at the same time, there's people that with a lot of money that basically use it as an alternative to the stock market. Because you are getting in some places 16, 18, 24 percent guaranteed return. And some people say, like, hey, I have a few hundred thousand dollars instead of putting in the stock market. I buy tax liens with it. And as the money comes back, I reinvest it and they're making killer returns. Mm -hmm. So it's an it's but it's a financial model, not a real estate model. Yeah. And when I last looked into it, the people that have done well with it, it's like two families. Two yeah. families with a crap load of money in the Phoenix yeah. market. And they just buy all the liens. Yeah. Um yeah. That's, so, uh, so, so that's why very quickly we, we, we didn't know about it. We studied it, it, and it was an entry gate into what we do today because it blew our mind as an immigrant over here. In Honduras, nobody would give up their land. I mean, that's what, what you own. That's like you work, you live for the ability to own land. There's entire, there's entire neighborhoods where they just invaded the land. They've built houses, I think, really the poor neighborhoods. Uh, they're invaded. There's no plumbing. They're thinking they've built entire cities on land that they don't own. They have no ownership rights and things like that. Land ownership is the ultimate wealth over there. Nobody would ever give up a piece of land. Same in Germany. Like land is like, there's 80 million people in Germany on the, on a, in a country the size of Illinois. Right. right? There, nobody, land is scarce. You don't give up land. So coming over here and people seeing people just letting them go was like like the biggest mind shift ever yeah. and that helped us then get get to like the next step and the next and the next step until we realized that land flipping is great that there's tons of people willing to give up their land for pennies on the dollar well yeah and land is a scarce resource in europe yeah it's an abundant resource in the united yeah, states absolutely uh so what were some of the biggest victories you had leading up to this point today biggest victories in terms of land deals in terms or of real estate. In terms of real estate. Well, um, interestingly, the, the, I mean, we've done land deals with $100,000 profits. I mean, one of my favorite deals, I talk about the property up north in, uh, in Prescott, Arizona, which is a nice retirement area that we bought for $1,875 and sold for $86,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a stupid return. I don't know right. how many thousands of percent that is, right? Um, but also, we bought a, a lot for $90,000, sold it for $200,000, things like that happen on a somewhat regular basis. Um, the biggest wins, though, is when we started realis realizing and that, the, that even though land flipping is profitable as, as heck, it is still an active business. And if you stop land flipping, now we, we will talk, you talked about the $70,000 in passive income. Um, we, we like selling our land with seller financing. So that was a big win when we realized that is a, that we can't even do that because, again, remember, we started with no knowledge whatsoever. So once we realized that instead of having to take a $30,000 piece of land that we put on a contract for $3,000, that's the discounts we're getting, and then sell it for fifteen, dollars and after closing costs make $11,000 or so, that we could also take this deal and sell it for $30,000 for full market value with a 
$5,000 down payment, which is more than what we pay for the property. Mm -hmm. So now you can do a double closing, right? You can do a closing where, where you do a title company and the buyer puts in $5,000. They use the five thousand, use 3000 to pay the seller, use the rest for their own expenses. So you don't get any cash, but now, now they still owe you $25,000 and you allow them to pay that over the next 10 years at monthly payments of $350 a month. Mm -hmm. Now you're building cash flow with no money in the deal. And $350 times 12 is what? Is $4,200 times 10 years is $42,000. So instead of making $11,000, you can now make $42,000 on a deal and you're building cash flow. That was a big win. And we built that up all the way to like over $70,000 in passive income. But then the, the ultimate win, I think, is when we started realizing that that we need to take the profits from this and roll it over into other asset classes. So we never, we never did, we never stayed away from, from houses because we didn't like houses. We stayed away from houses because we had no clue how to make it work and because it's way more complicated than what we do. But ultimately, we wanted to have houses and this passive cash flow, kind of the Kiyosaki thing, right? The passive yeah. cash flow. So now we, we were able to, let, to take the money, some of the money we make in land flipping, and for example, roll it over and own almost a thousand apartment units. Yeah. Like some with investors, but a lot of it without investors. Just Michelle and I, for example, in North Carolina, we own a 90 unit apartment complex that spits out as a net operating income of over $500,000 and there's no investors in it. Right. And it's pretty incredible. That's a huge win. That's a generational kind of income win. Mm -hmm. And and you have a few of those. Life is good. Yeah, life right. is really good. I think having one of those, <laughs> life is pretty good. Yeah. So let's talk about this. And right? that all came from that all came from the land money. Yeah. So once you realize that the land game is not the end game, as much as I love it and as much as I will always do it, it is still a means to an end. And the mm -hmm. end is absolute financial abundance to passive income from assets that you own and that will spit out cash forever. Yeah. Right? That was a big, that was a mind shift that is often, when you get into a business, you start losing that, you forget about it. You get so busy in the hustle mm -hmm. that you forget those things sometimes. So let's go back into it, right? So someone is listening right now. They want to, you know, we talk about how to make 70,000 per month in passive income, right. right? So obviously this is not something we're gonna do between now and the next year. Or next five years. Usually not. No. Right. This is something that you have to have an intentional plan th that you execute. So or, over a long period of time. Yeah. So to get to that number, yes. To get to get to get to a six figure income and get to some cash flow. I mean, obviously that can be done in a in a year. Mm -hmm. But yeah, usually you don't get to a seventy thousand dollar monthly income, eight hundred forty thousand dollars a year over or within one year. I've right. I've not really seen anyone do that. Yeah. Yes. So let's neither just, did we, by the way. Right. Let's just talk about it, right? So if someone like likes this message and wants to start building this passive income, mm -hmm. what are the first things they need to do in order to, to go in that direction? Well, they need to pick the vehicle that provides them the passive income. Mm -hmm. And and that's where I'm like, if, if if you pick land flipping, if you're specifically asking how to do it in land so flipping. How would Jack do it? How would Jack do it? Right, well, Jack is starting over right now. Jack's 25 years old. Yeah. If I like if I'm Jack starting over. I would honestly do the exact same thing again right. with a few tweaks. Like I would probably network earlier. I would probably do a little bit more coaching earlier on because we stumbled through it. We didn't even know there were coaches around. Mm -hmm. right? So we, we didn't, we lived in this kind of like isolation bubble or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and there's ways to, to accelerate and collapse, collapse the time period. Like we have coaching students right now that in the first year they did $900,000 in profits. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a good amount of money that you can then leverage into other things, right? Sure. But uh, the fastest way to do it is if you, if I would do it again, I would, I would start with land flipping again, obviously, mm -hmm. because, because it allows you to get the biggest bang for the buck. All right. So explain land flipping again. Yeah. Okay. So land flipping, what we do is we basically, over these different ways, we figured out that there's lots and lots and lots of people that own a piece of land, that they inherited it, that they've had it for many years, that perhaps... They want, had plans for perhaps they wanted to build a house on to retire on, but then the life and circumstances changed. Like perhaps they got ill or or they just want to be close to their grandchildren and so on. Or they bought one here and one here in the country and they built something here and now they have this one left over. Or they passed away and the heirs have it and many, many reasons why. But for many reasons, uh, they're willing to let these properties go at way steeper discounts than the house flippers because mm -hmm. they don't see the in, in immediate use in it. Like a house... 
if you're not completely stupid, you can basically figure out a way to to get somebody in there, rent it or or sell it, sell it as a handyman special or whatever thing, just get some use out of that house. Mm-hmm. Right? And a piece of land, people don't look at it and they're like, I don't know what to do with that thing. It's just sucking money out of my pocket. I don't want it. Mm-hmm. So we figured out that there's thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people that don't want there anymore. Figured out how to contact them with through direct mail. And then uh, how to get them on a contract. So we basically, we select an area, multiple areas. We like to focus on three kinds of properties. Infill lots, we sell those to builders. Lots in the path of growth, like 30, 40 minutes or 20, 10 to 45 minutes outside of a bigger city. We uh, love those because uh, the, 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 the buyers are either future retirees that can't retire in the city, but, and, or, uh, but because they, they, they want social security, won't cover their expenses. So they're looking for a lower cost retirement place. And outside of the town, our usually cost of living is lower. So they, they pay this off. They often they pay monthly payments. They pay this off. And then they, they later on put a mobile home on there once it's paid off and they have a dignified retirement. Or nowadays, with, since COVID, it's all the people that work from home. They love that kind of land. A lot of them, they love that kind of land because they want to be outside their city. They want to be spaced. Not everyone wants to live in a cookie cutter mm-hmm. neighborhood where the, where, the, where the neighboring fence is and you can reach it out of your window. Right. right. And so we... Uh, and the third kind of property we focus on is large acreage in the more recreational areas. And, and that has a built-in buyer base of, of all the RV people, the ATV RV people. Like you look at, we are both living in Phoenix. You look at Flagstaff up there every mm-hmm. Friday. It's a beeline up there with huge $100,000 RVs, ATVs, F-350s with motorcycles on the back, mm-hmm. uh, boat behind it, uh, you name it, camper behind it. Uh, and all those people have a ton of money. And they want land, mm-hmm. right? Great. So we have three areas that are absolutely, we have a ton of, a ton of built, in, built in demand. And we have a lot of it available too. Right. So that's what we focus on. So we, we pick an area of that. We can dive into that deeper in a little bit if you want to. And uh, once we pick that area, we now get a list of them through some of the data sources. And then we send them out direct mail. Direct mail for us still works because there's much less competition so the response rates in a well-selected area can easily be in the three or four percent range. Really, that's really high. On one letter, mm-hmm. not on repeat letters, but on one. Wow. Which is about ten x what what house flippers typically get, mm-hmm. and uh, on a volume thing. Yes, house flippers sometimes tell me, "Well, I get a three percent response rate on this tiny mi- micro niche, but you only send out two hundred fifty letters, right. so you got like two answers on that." And that's yeah, no, we're talking about you send out a few thousand letters or so, you get a hundred answers back. Yeah. And then, again, not all of them are willing to let these properties go for pennies on a dollar, but enough are. So we have some follow-up systems and so on that we do. And out of that, typically one out of 25 or 30 offers that you make get accepted. Mm-hmm. So you, get a, you, you send out 3,000 mailers, you get 100 answers, you have four deals coming into the door. And those four deals, you then immediately wholesale as a standard way is wholesaling them, and then you make money with that. And if the average profit, let's say in our student base, the average profit is about a $15,000 profit, then that's right there. That's $60,000. Yeah. So you spent two grand on marketing, make 60 grand. That's a trade I would do probably every day. Yeah. Right? And now you take that money and you reinvest some of that into your business and you build it up. The benefit of that method is number one, you can do it all 100% from home. Because you don't have to go see land. You can use aerial pictures for it. Also, because it's 100% from home, the entire United States is your playground. Uh, you can do it anywhere. So you pick the best areas that you like in the country. You go after it. The other benefit is like now within a very fairly short period of time, a few months, you've made 60 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand. And that becomes now your seed money for anything else you want to do. If ultimately you want to own apartment complexes, well, if you want to do a $10 million apartment syndication, in an apartment complex, in the multifamily world, in order to even get a loan for that, your net worth needs to be equal or higher than the purchase price of this property. So you need to have, a, if you want to be the sole syndicator for that thing, you need to have a $10 million net worth. Otherwise, you can't buy that lot, that, that building. So you need to build somehow some net worth. And that's where the notes come in. As, as you build these wholesale deals, over time, what you do is you also sell some with self-financing. Now, if you sell a property with $50,000 with a $10,000 down payment, 
you just built a forty thousand dollar note. Mm-hmm. When you have that forty thousand dollar notes and then make payments on it, your net worth just went up by forty thousand dollars. You do twenty five of those notes a year, your net worth just went up by a million dollars. Now you're much closer to qualifying for a smaller multifamily deal. On top of it, you have cash flow coming in, which the banks like to see. Right. And and then if you still do some cash deals, you have extra cash. Now you have the cash for the down payment. You have the net worth to qualify for the deal. And now you can buy some of these bigger deals. Yeah. Now, as we compare that to houses, if you want to do that same thing for a house, you build up $60,000. Well, you need that as a down payment for a house. The 60 grand are gone and you only have 500 in cash flow. If you do it with a land deals on that kind of deal, like $50,000, that you have on a contract for 10, you get a $10,000 down payment, you have zero money out of pocket, and you built a same $500 cash flow with zero money out of pocket. So it's superior in my mind. Yeah. If you structure it the right way. Oh, no, I totally see that. So uh, going back to identifying, so we've, we've identified the quality of the land or the avatar right. of the potential land seller, right? Uh, what are some of the systems or tools that you've seen have been very effective uh, for someone that's newer into the business trying to get into land? Well, um, the systems is like, well, we, we, we use, you don't really need a whole lot of systems. I mean, there are systems in place, like one of the systems we use, we have a software that we built for A to Z that, that helps you, that's connected to, to a mailing house, that's connected to even a data source, that's connected to, uh, that, that keeps your deals organized in the different statuses that they're in there. Like the deals you haven't sent out yet are here. The deals you have sent out are here. The deals where you got the answers on are here. The deals yeah. you need to skip trace, they're here. So it's basically a graphical kind of thing to keep everything, graphical uh, representation of your deals. And you can simply go, all right, today I want to do some skip tracing or send them for skip tracing. Today I want to make some offers. They're all over here. And uh, offer making tools and things like that. But uh, outside of that, uh, y- it's more like you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's systems, there's companies, there's services out there that allow you to do a lot of these things um, in an automated fashion. Sure. Was there any like one or two or three that you say like, man, like if you're going to start, if you haven't, if you haven't done your first land deal yet, yeah. here's where you should start. Well, you should start by selecting an area. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. And for that, uh, as I mentioned, you want to pick areas in the, uh, uh, you want to pick a few metro areas in the United States and you want to go ideally outside of those but don't pick the hyper growth areas. So go to Google, very simply search 100% 100 fastest growing metro areas in the United States. Pull it up. Scratch the first 10. Right? Because they're hyper growing. Mm-hmm. Now you don't want to be around Austin, Texas. Everyone in the world is scrapping up every single piece of land that they can find around Austin, Texas. Yeah. Right? Or, or, or Dallas, Texas. Like, you don't want to be immediately around Dallas because Dallas is, keeps working, growing like crazy. But how about some middle of the road metropolitan area that you can go and that is growing, but it's not growing so aggressively that everyone and their brother, because in this, looking for land, because even in these, in these hyper growth, hyper growth, in these hyper growth areas, even the house flippers don't get enough houses. So what the house flippers are doing, and you know, we're in couple of masterminds together. They started in the last few years, they started building houses because they can't get enough deals because the competition is so high mm-hmm. that they're starting to find land and then build on the land. Yeah. Right? So in those markets, it's going to be harder to find deals for us. So we're going to the second tier of markets where they're not building houses, where there's less competition, and and, and in this case, there's almost no competition. So the first thing is you use free available tools like Google to search those areas, then go outside. Then there's like a zip code tool. You you just simply go into Google and say zip code code tool, and you'll find out an area where you can simply pick pick any zip code in the country, and then say you can do like a 30-mile circle around it. So you pick Atlanta, Georgia, do a 30 or 50-mile. You do a 50-mile circle around it, and then you go outside and you see which counties are around here. Because mm-hmm. now you're far enough away for prices to be way lower. And you're still close enough for somebody to, to build, buy something there, retire there. And if they want to go to a ball game, they can go in. If they want to go see their ca- grandkids, they can go. If they need to go grocery shopping once every week or so, they go to Walmart, which is like 10, 15 miles away. So, and, and, and that is a free tool. These are mm-hmm. free things that people can use to find the areas. 
The next thing after that, you go and you pick land within, usually the value will go after within $10,000 and $500,000. We, um, we pick land that we like areas where there's a lot of kind of little roads and there's like open land, not necessarily area where it's only all farmland. So if you want to do this in Iowa, well, there's, it's farmland everywhere. Like Kansas, it's farmland everywhere. Farmland is an income producing property that a farmer is not just going to give you for 10 cents on a dollar. Mm -hmm. So this works, Midwest works, but there are certain states where they're all farmland. You kind of want to stay away from that. So you want to look at those from that angle a little bit. And then, and then uh, you, once you have that, you connect to a data source like, like Agent Pro, uh, no, like CoreLogic, like uh, we, uh, Data Tree, like things like that. And our software is connected to one of them. Mm -hmm. And you just basically say, I want... We typically ask people to select about six to eight such counties to start out with. And again, they can be anywhere in the U.S. because you don't have to be in your, net, in your backyard. Six to eight counties and then send about a $750 letter test mailing out to those counties. And what you'll find is that some of them you get a crappy result, some of them you get a decent result, and some of them you get amazing results. Then what you do is you probably get a deal or two from that, and that gets you to your first deal. Right. And wherever you got the deals, you go deeper and you do more deals there. And then, then and after that, at that point, you have, you have now done deals. At that point, you're a real estate investor. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you take the next step is optimizing the system. And that's what we work a lot with our coaching students together. We, we, it's all about like follow-up systems at that point. And like we like to use like uh, Sly Broadcast mm -hmm. to send an automatic follow up about two weeks after somebody makes an offer. Uh, so after we send our first offer, we say two to three weeks later, we send a slide broadcast over. It's like, hey, if you'd like to discuss the offer, please call us back. Yeah. If you people call back, you have an opportunity to negotiate with them. If they haven't, you go send another set of offers that's slightly higher. And things like that, negotiation techniques and things like that play a role there. So you can literally double and triple your amount of deals. And then, uh, the other question is, how do we sell them? Mm -hmm. And the selling side is, we actually use, uh, you can use realtors. Over time, you will build up a buyer's list. And some of the fastest sales are obviously the buyer's list. You do a deal in the town where you have, 20, where you have 50 or 100, 500 people waiting for a deal in that. Mm -hmm. You simply send it to them, same day, property sold, right? Gotcha. Um, sometimes we go to the neighbors in the area. And it's not just the next door neighbor. Like our very first deal sold to the neighbor. Like, but, uh, but I was a neighbor across the street, but many of our students sell up to a third of their deals to the neighborhood. If somebody owns a piece of land there, not everyone hates owning a piece of land there. Mm -hmm. Most people love their land and they would like to buy more because their brother wants a piece of land there. Their cousin wants a piece of land there. Their dad or their son, they want a piece of land there. Well, great. Pick about 50 to 200 people in that neighborhood send them a letter saying like, hey, send them a little package. They're like, hey, we got this property here. Third of our properties, are, our properties are, gone, are gone. So over time, as you build this, you sell a third to your buyers list, a third to the neighbors. You only have a third that you actually need to put up on the open market. Interesting. So we talked about acquiring it. What about the, the deal structuring? Like, How do you determine what to offer as far as seller financing? All right, so we have, we usually... Oh, about seller financing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the, whether or not you offer seller financing on the sales side in the first place really depends on a couple of things. The first thing it depends on is how cheap did you get the property? Because if I got a property, like I, I was telling Aaron earlier, one of your team members, if you do this at any kind of, uh, at any kind of volume, you can expect to at least once a year get a piece of land for free. Now, if you get it for free, that's a perfect candidate, or anywhere close to free. It's a perfect candidate to sell it with seller financing. Mm -hmm. What's your down payment that you need to have your money back? Right. Like zero, much. right? Yep. Every dollar, every dollar down payment is already, you're already in the money. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, these, these free deals, they're not $100,000 lots, right? <laughs> they're more like the lower end deals, the five, ten thousand $10,000 pieces of land. Mm -hmm. You get it for free, you, you sell it, you put it up for $8,900 with a $500 down payment, and because every dollar is free money. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you have a hundred thousand dollar that property that you get under contract for fifty grand and you're looking to sell it for seventy grand? Well, that would probably be more of a cash deal that you don't offer seller financing because it's extremely unlikely that somebody says, "Yeah, I'll buy it for even if you ask for ninety thousand uh, dollars, 
a full or close to market value says like I buy it for 90 and I give you 50 down. Yeah. That just doesn't happen. Right. They want to put typically about 10 to 20% down. So, so step one is how much you're buying it for. But for in relation, what percent of a market value mm -hmm. do you're buying it for? If you're buying it super cheap, it's a great candidate for seller financing. If you're going up the, the, the price ladder, then it's seller financing is not so easy to pull off because now you got to supplement the difference. Mm -hmm. Now with our coaching students, now you have an advanced audience, so I, I'm comfortable talking about that. But with our coaching students, we actually also work on an additional kind of way, which is called what we call a triple close. So we have built up in our universe a whole bunch of note buyers. So when you have a situation that you have a property that, let's say, it's worth $100,000, you have it under contract for $50,000, and you sell it for $90,000, and somebody comes, I buy it for ninety, dollars but I only give you $20,000 down. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a gap of $30,000 right in that deal. Right. What happens is what you can do if you, if, you, if you structure it right is what we call a triple close, which is number one, you, find that you say yes to that deal. So you have an agreement with the seller for 50. You have an agreement with the buyer for 90 with a $20,000 down payment and a $70,000 note. And then you bring in a note buyer. And the note buyer buys that $70,000 note for $60,000 right on the day you create that note. Mm -hmm. So now you have three transactions happening all on the same day. You have a you purchase it for 50, you sell it for 90, you get 20. So the buyer puts in $20,000 into escrow, but you also sell the note. So the note buyer puts in $60,000 into escrow. So the title company has $80,000 sitting in the account plus some closing costs. So now the title company takes 50 to 50 to the seller, gives 30 to you, so you make $30,000 and gives the note to the note buyer who then starts collecting on the money. Yeah. So you can still do deals like that without using any of your own money and make a deal that otherwise wouldn't work it become a $30,000 cash event for you. Yeah, a lot of advanced deal structuring there. There's a lot of advanced deal structuring, but usually our students don't do that on day one. Right. They usually do that a little bit later on in the deal. Or we, if it's, if it's just their very first deal looks like that, we just give them heavy help to, to, <laughs> yeah. to do that. Can I imagine doing that as my first deal? And then you talked yeah. a lot about this. You said, uh, was it uh, we were talking before the show, landprofitfund.com. Right. Yes, Land Profit Fun, like fun, like having fun, mm -hmm. no D at the end, yeah. landprofitfun.com, yes. So then the next thing you got to do is we've got deals we've locked up, deals we've sold, whether wholesale or uh, on seller finance. But that isn't the biggest chunk then of your passive cash flow, the, the, the selling the land. It's really reinvesting it in other assets then. Well, it, in 2009 it was. Because mm -hmm. between 2002, when we started, in 2009, we just had our blinders on, and all we did was land flipping and land flipping for cash and seller financing, and we built that up to over seventy thousand dollars in cash flow. So this at can that be time. done with just land. Yes, one hundred percent only land. We had not not touched any physical structure other than the house we lived in ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, which we still own. Now it's a rental property, but yes, so one hundred percent with land done, done with land. What we happened, what we realized at that point is that the land cash flow, if we ever stop flipping land, eventually will dwindle down because these land notes will be paid off. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we we're like, how many, we ask ourselves, how many times do we want to rebuild that over time? Well, we don't. We want to maintain it high because we love land flipping, but we need to take the money off the table at $70,000 a month worth of money off the table and move that into other asset classes. So initially in 2009, when the market was in shambles and houses in the Phoenix area that the year before were worth $200,000, now we're selling for $40,000, it means we could buy two houses a month cash. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. Yeah. So for a couple of years, we went, we went and bought two houses a month, just cash. Just moved that money, just bought them, bought them, bought them, bought them, bought them, and then put some money into, into fixing them up and renting them out. And the nice part is we still own those houses. Wow. And now they're not worth 40, they're worth 400, mm -hmm. and we still have them. Yeah. And obviously that now is producing a multiple six-figure cash flow for us too. Yeah. So I was that idiot realtor that was selling you those houses <laughs> for thirty dollars to $40,000, right? Hey, Steve, I'm going to go look at some houses. I'm going to look uh -huh. at some foreclosures. Like, yeah, sure, no problem. Let's get in the car. Let's go look at these. Yeah. So you were buying them. We were buying them. Yes, yeah. we were buying them. And we stopped way too early. When the prices hit like two hundred thousand dollars, we're like, "Oh, that's too expensive." Last that's insane. Show. That's insane. And we went to other markets. We continued buying that in Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. where we bought them for fifty or sixty. 
And we just today, just before we got on the podcast, I sold my very last one there uh, because for they 60. no for 130. So they they we we doubled the value on those, not 10x, but double. But those were, and that's also a lesson learned. The Phoenix properties cash flow like crazy because we specifically focused on 1950s brick built properties that cannot be destroyed. In Cleveland, we bought 1920s bungalow style buildings that constantly had a $10,000 repair. So mm. we never made any cash flow on those, but at least over the last five to seven years, they doubled in value. So we got something from it. But, yeah, what uh, was it? Uh, I think uh, that's why we sold them. The Phoenix one, we never sell. The term I learned, uh, we, we learned from Frank Cava, right, at CG was unbreakable. Yes. Right, we want to buy unbreakable properties. That's exactly right. And that's why we bought in Phoenix. They're not in great areas, but they're unbreakable. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, so then over time, we, we just we kept pushing that. And, and then from there, we transitioned. We said, like, well, if we can't have a portfolio of Phoenix, uh, houses in Phoenix that we never see, and a portfolio of houses in Cleveland, and a portfolio of houses in Omaha, Nebraska that we never see, then why don't we take a step up? and start taking the money we make from land flipping and roll it into multifamily. Mm -hmm. And that's when we started buying 50, 70, 100, 150 unit apartment complexes and started getting to the syndication game. But the answer is always like, we focus on land flipping and on teaching land flipping. And that is what we use as asset allocation. We don't okay. teach it. We never have plans to teach it. We, we just, this is our end game. Real estate, pile it up, keep it for long term, have it cash flow. So if we ever pull the plug and decide to retire, that pays for a lifestyle for the yeah. rest of our life. So lives. you did the right thing when you were rich poor dead. You actually bought assets that cash flowed. Right. Um, so you flipped over 4,500 pieces of land, owned over 1,000 doors. Close to 1,000. Uh, close just to 1,000. Just under 1,000. And over 3,000 acres of land. Now, there's a couple of things that uh, we have in common. So you and I both present at ASRIA, so mm -hmm. Arizona RIA, the local yep. RIA. So if you guys are in Phoenix, you might catch Jack and me periodically at the local RIA. We're both within a collective genius. Right. Yeah. So I've been in there since beginning of 2020 as the, I joined as a sales trainer. And that's like one of, one of the best decisions I ever made. How long have right. you been in CG? Oh, I've been in CG probably since 2013. So you're one of the original guys. No, I think they started in 2010 or 11. So okay. I, I, two or three years into it, I joined. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So why do you still go? The human connections you make over there, first of all, real estate always changes. Right? Yeah. I was on a, on a, on a multifamily investors group call from Collective Genius today mm -hmm. and learned a ton already, uh, again, uh, just from understanding from, some, uh, from other people that, that operate very high level funds, particularly the finance guys we're talking today, the fund managers and uh, the mortgage brokers about where we are in the, in the, in the interest rate and the thing, what's happening, what, what, and, and it's all about getting visibility really. Mm. So I'm, I'm probably the best answer about CG is I've, I've yet to find a better place where you have people that live, that, that do deals day to day and have their ear on the ground and their entire body on the ground. They live on a, on the ground like and know exactly what's going on in their market, come together and openly share what they see in the market on a quarterly basis, on a daily basis to the Facebook group and things like that. Yeah. And what it really means is that like the number one regret I have, and it's, it's a regret on a very spoiled level, right? Mm -hmm. I want to say that the number one regret I have is that back in 2009, 10, 11, I did not buy 100x more houses, mm -hmm. right? And the reason I didn't is because I didn't have that environment around me of people that basically could help me with bringing the money to the table. Right? Could help me. We, we paid those houses cash. If I would have had somebody that says like, you know what, Jack, I'll give you $10 million to buy those more, $20 million, whatever it is, to buy, to buy 50 more of these houses or 500 more of these houses, whatever it is. Uh, and, and, and then, I, I mean, it would have been a 10x impact. Mm -hmm. Like we made really good money on those, but now it would have been like nine figures, right? Mm -hmm. in, in profits. And, and so I learned that when you, when, when the market changes, the very most important thing you got to have is you got to be able to plug into a community that has visibility about what's going on in every single market that can give you, that can, t that, yeah, it gives you like a crystal ball really. Mm -hmm. Cause like there's certain markets that always go first. 
Phoenix is one of them. Florida is one of them. Nevada is one of them. In the housing world, there's certain markets that always take the lead on the, the way down, and they always take the lead on the way up. Mm -hmm. Well, if you just have the blinders on, you don't know that. You don't see that. So CG is a great value. Plus, I mean, one of the guys in CG taught us how to do, uh, how to flip, uh, how to buy apartment complexes. Mm -hmm. One of the guys in CG is our partner in Cleveland that we're buying that, we bought like 17 houses in Cleveland, only one of them I've ever seen. We already sold them, all, uh, the last one today, yeah. but uh, I've not seen 16. You build trust relationship with people to the degree that you allow them to buy houses for you, sight unseen, and, uh, and, and so on. And, and, and that's a rare kind of place in the world to have. So there's yeah. like, and on top, I mean, there's experts, they're doing stuff that I've never even, still this day, never even heard about. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic group and there's multiple like deck out there, but I think CG is the best. Yeah. And you know, you talk about buying properties, right? You wish you would have bought more. That's all. That is my biggest regret. Cause I still remember going to Arizona Ria back in 2007 and seeing these guys talking about, you know, buying these properties and here's a hard money. And at this time I was like, who is stupid enough to borrow money at 18%, right? Mm -hmm. This is the mindset I have. Yeah. Who is stupid enough to borrow money at 18%. One of my biggest regrets is never buying any properties at 18% money when you could have bought those houses at forty, fifty thousand dollars yeah. Because you would cash flow from day one. Yeah, even at 18%. Even at 18%. Yeah. Right? And we ultimately did got a not-so-hard money loan. That's the smartest thing we did. We, we, we tapped out our cash, and we wanted to buy some more. And we went back to a hard money loan that gave us a loan at like about 10% interest rate. And, um, and that allowed us to buy another, I don't know, whatever, another 10 houses or so with that. And that was great because like, the cash flow paid them off within a matter, and the cash flow from our land that kept paying them off, they were paid off within a year and a half. And, and those houses went up millions of dollars in value. Yep. So one of my biggest regrets. Um, but hey. uh, the other thing too, though, you're talking about CG. So one of the funny things is, you know, I've been going around letting everyone know, hey, you know, Steve invested in a bank. Right? Steve is the founder of a bank. I do all these crazy things, right? Um, yeah, we, we own a bank together. We own yeah. a bank together, right? And I've had people ask me, like, well, you know, how hard was that? I was like, well, not very hard for me, <laughs> right? These other guys worked really hard for 14 years. I was right. like the last guy. I was like, hey, we're going to we're going to Tucson. You want to jump on the bus with us? Yes. <laughs> that was my involvement yeah. <laughs> in, in the yeah. bank. In essence, there's basically what, what we're talking about is Scottsdale Community Bank, mm -hmm. which is a great brand new bank. Uh, and uh, I, I helped them raise some money for mm -hmm. it. And... Part of that money raising, I think uh, you heard about it, and you're like, "Hey, can I still get on board?" And mm -hmm. and so uh, so yes, and so we both invested in the bank. We're we're founding members of the bank, mm -hmm. but we don't really have any operational involvement. I think I'm I'm on a board of advisors or so mm -hmm. for the bank, or yeah. about to be on a board of advisors for the bank. That's about it. And yeah. they wanted me on the board of directors, which at the time I declined because mm -hmm. I was too busy. Uh, we'll probably rejoin at some point of time again. But yeah, and and perhaps you too. Who knows? But uh, but the um, but yeah, it's a, it's a fun thing to be able to say, "Hey, we own a part of the bank," and that's certainly true. It's certainly true. And the thing that's what what the connection was though was that someone was saying, "Hey, who's got a good bank in Arizona?" I commented, "Here's who I use." You commented, "Hey, you know, here are some resources." Or if you guys can wait a little bit, I got a bank opening in so and so day, right? That was all you said. That's right, yeah. And I messaged you immediately. Tell me more about this. How do I join you in opening this bank together? And you were able to connect me with the chairman and president and so on. But that's the power of networking. Yeah. That's the power. Like if I was not in CG with you, I would not have known about this opportunity to invest in a bank and we wouldn't be able to, you know, have been investors in this bank together. Yeah. Oh. Right? Absolutely. The power of a group like that. I mean, I put an eight figure net worth increase uh, just on being a part of that group. I mean, uh, for example, that's that's just easily eight figures, easily ten million dollars that my net worth have grown just from being part of that group and the connection and the investment opportunities and things that are made for that. Just last just last year, we, we saved our tax rate. Tax rate went from whatever the top tax rate to I think we. We're going to have an average and, and a tax rate of under 5% mm -hmm. for the year because of some of the investments we made through that group. Yeah, I'm, like I'm guessing crazy. probably with, uh, with Big Mike. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And then, uh, and yeah, if you join, you know, communities like CG, you get to learn about guys like Big Mike. Um, and then we're also in family together. 
Yes, that's right. I right? just joined that. Yes, you just joined that. That's right. So, um, you talked about one of your things you wish you'd done earlier was networking. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I know we just touched on it a moment ago as far as collective genius, but you know, if you were to start all over again, you would start networking earlier. Yeah. So, for those that are listening right now that aren't networking, what would you say to them? Yeah, network. I mean, I, I posted on something. There was a in a different group by by a guy that does a lot of creative finance. Um, somebody says like, hey how do I go about that? It's like, I, I feel like I need money to invest. And it's like, no, you don't need money to invest. You need creativity, you need knowledge, and you need a network. Because mm-hmm. every, if, like, even in our coaching business, I mean, there's, there's the people we, we, we enjoy helping the most is those that actually are doing the work and wanting and asking for help. Mm-hmm. Like, so if you go, number one, join a RIA. Join a Real Estate Investment Association absolutely crucial and then go don't just join is don't just join like you join a gym actually go every single month to the meeting and don't just sit in a chair and attend the meeting go they have a networking session go from booth to booth go get business cards ask people talk to people like even if you're a shy person get over that inner uh, that inner hurdle and, and and talk to people and get their business cards and ask them what they're doing and build a little bit of a rolodex and then as you go, even if you do this on your own without coaching, whatever, as you find deals, run those deals by those people. Like call them, hey, we met the other day. I got a deal in there. Would you mind taking a two-minute look at it? Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to tell you no for the first couple of deals. Now, of course, if you send them 25 deals and they all suck, at some point of time, they're going to be like, uh, no, right? <laughs> yeah. but, but then spread them around. If you have five people to ask, send one deal to this guy, one this, and, and have them just give you an estimate. And if they say they have a deal... If they say this is a deal, guess what? That same person probably has the connection to actually make that deal happen for you. Join venture with them. Do a thing. The first deal is not about maximizing money. The first deal is about getting that experience in so you can say you have done a deal. Mm-hmm. And once you have done a deal, everyone takes you more seriously. You actually take yourself more seriously. You walk through life with your with your head up because you're now a real estate investor. And and sure enough, within a few weeks, you know who is the money guy in the room. You know, who is the network, who is the title company in the room? Who is the attorney in the room? Who is the, who is the person that uh, is the creative finance guy in the room? Who has the buyers list in the room? And, and once you have that, you, you, you got your dream team. You got your team around. It might not be ultimately dream team, right? There's a lot of crooks in this industry too. So there might be people that try to get a piece of your deal and you learn the hard way with that. But at least you have a team now. Mm-hmm. You know where to go to get the money. You know where to go to sell the property. And then you give up pieces of your deal in order to do that, but at least you get a deal. Absolutely. Right? And, and, and that's, a free, that's all free. It might cost you $150 a year membership in ARIA to do that. And, and, and you're out, at least you, you, you get going. That's what we did. We started out as ARIA. As a matter of fact, Michelle is member number two in the Arizona Real Estate Investor Association. Really? I'm member number three. Really? Yeah, because we had no experience, nothing whatsoever. But we were told, join ARIA. It was like, we Googled it. They had a website. I think Alan Langston put the website up, the former owner, put the website up the day before or so. And I was like, and I contacted him. He's like, yes, of course, we're taking members. I was like, great. <laughs> Became members. We went to the very first meeting. There were like 35 people there, yeah. and that's it. And, uh, and they, had no, no, they had nothing in place. Was it, did Alan have a bunch of white hairs back then, too? He did actually. Like it was half white, but half white hair by that time. But but yeah, this is. So we joined that, and and we had never done a deal. We were the newbies in the room. But then guess what? Within a little bit of time, there's like a sponsoring title company. Well, guess what? My God, I have a deal. What do I do now? Well, oh, I have the phone number of that person. Hey, do you take this deal? Yes, let's go. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there's a realtor there. Can you help sell this property? Yes. Okay, great. Let's go. Right. And 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 soon enough, you have you have a team together, and then. Some of them fall away if they don't perform over time and, and you truly build your dream team over time. But uh, like the first attorney we hired there was crap. But then the second, the third attorney we found through them is my attorney still to this day. Yeah, and again, I, I mentioned earlier, right? Like one of my biggest regrets was not paying more attention when I was going to the local RIA events. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, again, talking about networking is uh, we got a mutual friend, Mike uh, Fitzgerald. And uh, he is, as far as I can tell, the single best networker alive, right? The guy will say hi to anybody and everybody at yes. all times and let them know that he's in real estate. And the doors he's opened, I think he's opened more doors than anybody else, right? Who hangs out with, like, the prime minister in Korea 
and princes and all these and, and, yeah. and all these other Middle Eastern countries. It's yeah. absolutely insane. It, it is insane, right? Yes. While also hanging out with NFL athletes on the weekends. Yeah. Just crazy what that guy's. And he's like his five foot three kind of guy yeah. that that doesn't look like anyone that you would we would. I mean, we love him. Like, uh, Mike is great. Actually, yeah. And again, those to those kind of things, we got in line of credits with banks. We got in established mm -hmm. relationships because he told me, like, here's what you say. You go, you go to the bank and you ask for this person. And this is the exact words you say. It's like, great. And uh, yeah, it's it's fantastic the, yeah. the people you meet. And if you guys need a loan, Jack and I can help you, uh, you get a loan. Uh, so before we get into the question, I want to ask you one more question before we go to the uh, the, the audience's questions. You are here preaching about land. Why don't more people do land? Because it flies under the radar. There's no TV show. How could it fly under the radar? You've been talking about it for so long. I know. And we have <laughs> been very successful uh, changing people's lives with it. But the first, like, here's a standard. Here's an answer that one of the people that, that now is doing fantastic in land flipping gave me. He listened to, he found a new podcast from somebody. And there was 10 episodes. And he looked at them and was like, okay, I like the first episode. And he's like, let me look at the other nine. And I was like, I'm going to listen to all of them. But this one, he ranked them in terms of interest. And they were all real estate ones. And then one of them was about land flipping with me. And he's like, well, that's the least thing. Well, who wants, what's land? Land, land has this perception that it's boring, that it takes forever, that it's expensive. Because people think of the downtown $5 million development land that you need to spend millions of dollars uh, bribing the county councils that you need to, uh, whatever thing, I don't know, but that you need years to development, that you have to go back and forth, and, and then you have to work with someone, like you get a $100 million construction loan to build a high-rise on it. That's what people think about with land. Or they think about it as farmland being expensive. Or they think about it as just like this useless thing that sits there and just steals your property taxes. Mm. No matter what, there's no, no positive association with land for most people. And as a result, they're not interested. Also, there's no HGTV show that says, flip this land, right? <laughs> because what do I, people say, like, Jack, you should do a TV show. It's like, what are we going to do? Michelle and I sitting on the desk and, 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 and typing some and working on our computer and making offers? Like, that's like, that's dead on arrival, this kind of show, right? Yeah. I mean, of course, could it be make fun if we go out to the desert and we chase some rattlesnakes off our land and go shoot and some guns. Like in a, go shoot some what? Go shoot some guns. Go shoot some guns and things like that. But then, then yes, you can make it kind of probably entertaining and so on. But, but there's no land flipping show because there's no before and after, mm -hmm. right? The, what, what makes house flipping shows so attractive to people is like, Look at this ugly dog here, yeah. and let's look at this thing afterwards. Oh, my God, see the before and after. And then our before and after is like, you see this piece of land? Looks exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Looks exactly the same. There's nothing, there's nothing we can do about it. Well, it saves the production cost, right? Because you only have to go out there once. Right, that's true. That's true, <laughs> yes. And so, so bottom no line is there's nobody that. out there. It's not, it's not sec perceived to be sexy. But you actually, every podcast in your studio, you have a wall where everyone that's on a podcast needs to be something putting out something on there mm -hmm. and sign it. I put it on there, land is sexy. Because <laughs> you know what's sexy about it? If you can get a piece of land for 10, for 10 cents on a dollar and sell it for 50 cents on a dollar and that 40% spread is $40,000 and you don't see it and you don't do with it and you don't have to leave your family and your kids and, and, your, and your spouse and, and, and you can have dinners whenever you want and you don't have to sit in people's kitchen, a kitchen table, that's sexy mm -hmm. to me. And the profits are sexy, and it's all virtual. So the so. lifestyle and the money is sexy. The lifestyle, the money is sexy. Just the, the product's not the, sexy. The, the, the product is sexy, too, particularly if you go a step further. Mm -hmm. And, for example, a lot of the people that work with us in the late stages of coaching, they take it a step further. For example, we have one of our coaches who actually takes properties and, and now splits them. She takes, let's say, three acres, and she splits them into six half-acre lots, and then she gets a construction firm to come in and build mobile home hookups into it. Mm -hmm. Then she has a mobile home uh, company close by, a mobile home dealership, put actual mobile homes on it. And then they sell them uh, as a package. And a deal that she would normally make $30,000 as a normal flip, by splitting it, she takes that and makes it from $30,000 to $100,000. By putting the utilities in, she takes it from $100,000 to $250,000. So mm -hmm. now she's making, instead of making like... Um, yeah, 30 grand on one deal, she makes a quarter million dollars on that exact same deal by putting a little bit of extra mm -hmm. effort in it. Yeah. And it might take six months to do all of that, 
but that is sexy too. Now you can do it before sexy. and after. Yeah, now we can actually and do a reveal. Good. Yeah, yeah. You can, there you can do a reveal. So all of that is possible. Now, why else is not so? Why, why is not sexy? It's because people don't think about it. So this guy in the podcast, he put, he ranked us least, and he listened to this and that and that and that, and then he listened to ours. But then, as he when he finally was done with the episode, it's like, oh my god, this is the best thing I've heard about. And then he reached out to us, and then he enrolled in coaching, and then he and and now he's doing like multiple six figures. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so let's go ahead and go uh, do a quick break, and then we're gonna go to audience's questions. Before I got into real estate, I always wanted to become a teacher. The main reason I actually have a sales training platform is to actually fulfill my passion and teach you guys more about real estate and sales. Something I've learned along the way though is that learning from my teaching alone is not enough. It's also helpful if you learn from others. That's why on May 17th, I'm launching something that will allow you to learn from others that are also doing sales. This is all a part of my mission of creating 100 millionaires. So the best ways to become a millionaire is to become excellent at sales and learn how to connect with others. So if you want to improve your sales and learn alongside other sales assassins, make sure you tune into my podcast on May 17th. And as an added bonus, if you purchase my sales masterclass, you will get lifetime access to what we're launching. So to entice you, we are offering 50% off, but this offer does expire on May 10th, 2023. If you want to become our next millionaire, DM me the word masterclass now all right so let's go to the audience's question so the first question is our great friend ingrid on youtube uh so yeah well she's basically saying that you can mit mitigate let's just start here who are the main types of buyers buying land on seller finance so we talked about the avatar right for the guy that's selling it guy yeah. and gal selling it what's the avatar for the guy buying land on seller finance all right so the uh on seller finance specifically so the builders usually buy cash mm -hmm. the the people who buy seller financing is typically the, um, the future retiree, somebody who has just basically doesn't have a ton of money. It's usually, unfortunately, in the United States, there's a sad statistic that basically says that that's, I think it's 70% of all the people over the age of 50 don't have more than a few thousand dollars saved up. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the Social Security predictions, I mean, the average Social Security check is under $2,000. So This is not going to work. Exactly. This is not going to work. You have no money saved up. You're getting fifteen hundred dollars in Social Security. You can't even rent an apartment and and pay your or pay a car payment or put gas in the car and insurance. Your money's gone. You you're, you're starving. Mm -hmm. That concept of old age poverty is actually something that's going to come up way more in the United States. It's already in Europe. Everyone thinks of Europe, especially Germany, is like the social. No, the old people in Germany are suffering massively because they're getting eight nine hundred dollars in Social Security and they can't live of it. Wow, uh, I have no idea. So. But, and the same is gonna happen in the US. So, so the smart ones, I always joke, the smart ones, they're, they're, they're learning from us and how to flip land. But uh, the second ones, the ones that don't know we exist, they go and they start thinking about, well, how can I retire? And the logical answer comes like, well, if I own the land and perhaps I get a mobile home, I can do it. But they don't have the money to pay a $30,000 piece of land. So they're looking around and it's like, oh, I can put down $5,000 on this piece of land and pay $300 a month for the next 10 years and pay it off? Let me do that. Mm -hmm. So you, we are enabling them to do that because banks don't like, don't, wouldn't never finance them. Right. Banks would never give them a loan. If anything, a bank with the most, the bank would give is a 50% loan to value. So even on a $35,000 deal, they would have to come up with $15,000 and no bank even touches a $30,000 piece of land. So in essence, they don't have any other choice. So we are allowing them to actually have a dignified retirement. And it's a great service to, to them. And so they pay it off over the next 10 years. And then they get a, a used mobile home, put it on there, and they have a good retirement. So that's, that's them. Um, often also, it's an interesting thing. Seller financing does not have to do with, uh, does not have to do with the availability, availability to cash. In the market that we're in right now, where, where houses came down in value, and now they're kind of stagnant and perhaps coming back up again in some markets like Phoenix, um, it's more of a psychological thing. People have money, especially if you're going to a recession or something. It's our second time to go to a recession here, but if in the recession people still have money, but they don't want to spend it all on one thing. Mm -hmm. So they're choosing to do the seller financing if you offer it. They're choosing it just so that they have some powder still dry on the sideline for other emergencies. But the moment they see that the economy is flipping back into the positive, 
and the cry any kind of crisis or, or their own crisis or as long as they feel the confidence at the moment they feel confident in their own financial abilities again they paid off mm -hmm. and that's what happened in 2008 9 10 we we went we went from 70 percent cash and 30 percent seller financing to 80 percent seller financing and 20 percent cash and the moment we came out of that everyone and their brother paid off their loans hmm. right because they had money they just didn't choose to spend it all so that's often uh, it's often more like a a conservative person doesn't want to but that's the same thing i i i came driving here with my sports car right? i i finally after 22 years in the in the business i could have afforded that car 20 years ago but i chose it to buy it now i have mm -hmm. a, not, a porsche 911 convertible right? mm -hmm. so, oh yeah it's parked right here when I, when I drove in yeah. yeah exactly that's 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 i love that car it's it's my toy at age 51 last year, I finally bought myself that toy, and I love it. So bottom line is, though, did I pay it cash? I would imagine not. No. Yeah. First of all, the interest rate is super low. But secondly, no, because I can use that cash for other things. Which provides higher return. Which provides higher returns. So even I didn't pay cash for it. Mm -hmm. Now... I'm paying it off aggressively. Usually I look around. If, I, if things continue to do well, I just pay it off within a year usually. My cars, I don't like to carry on long, long, long car loans. But initially, I always get it financed. And it's a kind of the same psychology. Sure. That makes, that makes total sense. Uh, so going here, uh, Pixel Dust Tech on Instagram. How do introverts network? Um... That is a question I would like to bring in my wife now for, mm -hmm. <laughs> because Michelle is a, is a hardcore introvert. Yeah. Like Michelle is not, uh, she, she gets anxiety, clammy hands, heart racing, things like that. Any time we go into any kind of social environment, her question is always like, what do I talk to these people about? What, what do I do? The answer I think is, do you have a friend that is not an introvert? have that person come along with you and introduce you. Very often, I'm not the introvert of the family. So I go out there, I meet people. And it's like, hey, by the way, have you met my wife, Michelle? Like, uh, and she's like, she's our CEO. She's like, uh, she's, she's doing this business with us. Oh, great. And all you need as an introvert is an introduction because the hardest thing, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if you're an introvert or not, but uh, uh, the hardest thing is, is, is getting that introduction. And once mm -hmm. you start talking to somebody and you have a subject that is both of interest for both party, mm -hmm. the parties, then it actually starts rolling usually. Yeah, you, right? get, you can get momentum in that conversation. So, yeah, yeah so Pixel Dust, I will share, because I am an introvert naturally, right? Uh, it, it may not appear that way, and to those in my family, they don't believe me when I tell them I'm an introvert. Uh, but, you know, I had um, uh, Austin McCurdy, who is a specialist in the predictive index, right? Mm -hmm. We look at this, like, okay, so according to my profile, I'm a very introvert, introverted, which I would agree with. And I asked him, like, why, if I'm an introvert, am I, like, consistently at these networking functions and this and that? He's like, it's really easy. Your desire to win is so much stronger than your desire to be comfortable okay. not talking to people, right? So, you know, Pixel Dust, potentially, if you have a desire to win, if you are not satisfied with your current situation, that is what should drive you, right, yeah. out there to go shake hands and this and that. The other thing, too, that's something I learned uh, from Darren Hardy is that it doesn't require a ton of bravery. It requires three seconds of bravery. Mm-hmm. Right, you only need to be brave for three seconds. Stick your hand out, say hi, and then start the conversation. Right, that's what you're yeah. saying. Once the momentum started, it's okay. Yeah, it's yeah. that initial threshold that's the and, challenge. And also, I want to add to that one thing is that you don't need, don't set your expectation that you have to meet 25 people. Mm -hmm. Meet two every time you go there. One, for that matter. Yeah, one is enough because that person, if you meet the right person, that person then introduces you to 10 more people, or you have that connection. So like, hey. Do you happen to know somebody that lends money? Do you happen to know a good title company? Do you happen to that? And that person becomes your multiplier and that introduces you to the other people you know. Right? Absolutely. And the first time around you meet, you might meet another newbie that doesn't have a clue either, right? And then, okay, well, then you go back home. It's like, but who knows? That newbie might six months later not be a newbie anymore. Mm -hmm. And now you still have a good connection. And, and it's just do, because what I understand from Michelle being an introvert is that introverts make much deeper connection with people than the non-introverts. Mm -hmm. Like one of my best friends is like the ex, the, the most extroverted person I ever meet. I mean, we call him the mayor mm -hmm. because he knows freaking anyone. Wherever he goes, he owns a, a, an, an Airbnb in Sedona. Everyone in the neighborhood three months later knew him. Right. We own a house in Sedona. Nobody knows us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, so the thing is, 
But his, a lot of relationships he has are very, very superficial without that being a bad word. Right? Mm. He, just, he just is a fun guy to hang out with. It's not somebody you, you, you discuss the meaning of life with. Mm -hmm. right? So as an introvert, you like to do that much more. Right? So you, you make one deep connection with one person and you maintain that. And then you next time come, come to the meeting, you make another connection and, and so you grow. Yeah, that's a great point. So I hope that helps Pixel Dust because I'm also an introvert, but this, despite what my family believes, I don't actually like to go and meet new people unless I know this network, this connection is going to help me win. Which, by the way, explains why he's such a good interviewer because introverts, they want to know more things. They go deeper. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's if you look at a lot of the influencers in the space, they're actually naturally introverted. Yeah. Right? They don't have to talk to anybody. They just have to look at a camera and start talking. Yeah. Exactly. Um. Lotto on YouTube, what is the most common reason people fail from flipping land? The same reason in any real estate method is that they don't, um, they don't stick to it. Mm -hmm. Shiny penny syndrome. Like you don't get successful by sending out a thousand letters or 5,000 letters or whatever number is once. Um, and then don't do the steps. Like it's, 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 it's the same thing. Um, but the number one area is probably uh, really picking picking the wrong areas and not sending out enough mail. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. If you pick, if you put some thinking into these areas and look at, you you go into Zillow and you see how many properties have sold in that area about in the last six to twelve months, and how many are listed. You talk about the ratio. If you see that there's five thousand that have sold and thirty are listed, you know in your hyper growth area, right? Yeah. If you see that there's three hundred listed and three hundred have sold. You see, you're in a balanced market, but that's the balanced market is good. The hyper growth area is not good, right? So just apply some some common sense to it. Pick some areas that look like they're nicely more or less balanced. Uh, either way, a little bit, little bit in either way is fine. It's like it's okay to have an area where it's twice as many listed as sold, as long as there's enough sold that shows activity. It's okay to have the twice as many sold as there's listed. That means there's a little bit act more activity going on, but that's all okay as long as within outside of the extremes and uh, and then and then pick those areas send enough mailing out like i always say like if you send 50 letters out it's a crap shot if you take a coin and you flip it five times or 10 times what's going to the outcome you don't know it might be 10 times head and zero tail mm -hmm. but if you flip it a thousand times chances are it's going to be very close to 500 and 500 yeah so over time there's a lot of large numbers that as you send out enough mailing out the natural quality of that county is going to come out and you're going to get enough responses to tell you if that is a good county or not. If you send out just 50 letters, it's not going to work. Right. Uh, and then Chim Zerim, I apologize, on Facebook, wants to, uh, they're, they're saying they're interested. So okay. how would they get started? Well, you go to Land Profit Fun, F-U-N, so like having fun, right? LandProfitFun.com. And you can download like a 30-day free blueprint on land flipping. It gives you a bunch of the steps. Uh, also, I mean, if I may say, I invite you to listen to my podcast, mm -hmm. which we're, where there's, there's different things we talk about, which is the Jack Boss Show. Mm -hmm. So I kept it open because I want to talk about more than just land flipping. I want to talk about entrepreneurship. I want to talk our company now, between all our companies, we have 85 people in our company. So we have learned one or the other things about building a larger company and so on. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk, but there's a lot about land flipping in it. Or you go to my YouTube channel is Jack Bosch. Mm -hmm. And there's actually also seven videos, like we call it the seven days of land flipping, where I go to the, to the process steps in short 10 minute videos quickly also. So you can, you can learn from all of these things, but Land Profit Fund is the best place to get started right away. Perfect. Uh, so Lotto, follow-up question, with $10,000 uh, available to work with, what would you recommend he do? Um, if you want to invest a little bit into education, you can. Obviously, there's us, there's other people. Uh, I mean, we obviously believe we call ourselves the Harvard of land flipping. So because we are really have the most comprehensive program, mm -hmm. there's a lot of the people teaching out there. They're all successful teachers. A lot of them focus on the bottom end kind of properties. Like, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not the only thing in, in, in real estate to focus on. Like a lot of the teachers out there are focused on finding a $5,000 property for 500 bucks and then selling it for $5,000 with a $500 down payment and then getting $100 a month. That's great. But you need a ton of deals in order to make any kind of financial impact. 
We do anything from that. We have students making right now. We have a student that, that is about to make an eight hundred thousand dollar profit on a deal. Mm -hmm. wow. right? uh, that's not bad, right? So uh, that's obviously a multi million dollar property. We have students that go into land development that go um, that that built uh, all of these kind of things. So we have much more knowledge in this. So with ten thousand dollars, you can. I, I would. I would. I would enter one of the entry level programs. But then. Um, but then again. The majority is really on making sure you you get those counties right and do those test mailings. So if you wanted to pay, pay like about four thousand dollars of that and use that on marketing, and if if you selected the counties right, there there I have a very very high confidence rate in you having not just one but multiple deals from that. And then the marketing uh, platforms you recommend? Marketing from the acquisition or, or disposition? Direct mail. The that? direct mail. Uh, we or I guess is, is it only is predominantly direct mail. Yes, we predominantly direct mail. Can you do direct, can you do cold call and things like that? Yes, um, I'm not a big fan of it because of all the lawsuits and things that you mm -hmm. get for it, and 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 email goes into spam and so on. But um, some students on a smaller scale are seeing success by doing that too. So if you have experience with cold call, you can add that to it too, of course, but uh, at your own risk. But uh, uh, because again, there's people out there just waiting for being cold called and then suing people for there it. There are there are people um, that are doing really well with that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. And, I am. <laughs> uh, and so the marketing thing, we we use um, Data Tree, mm -hmm. but we have a master account with them in our software. So for those that subscribe to our software, they can actually add on a little account to it and then pull directly from Data Tree. But any of these, if you already have a subscription, one of the data services by now, most of them have land data. Mm -hmm. Like two years ago. Most of them did not have land data. Now land is starting to become sexy, actually, and and a lot of these services are starting to add land data. I never thought I would live to, the, to see the day or hear the day where land is sexy. Hey, I'm excited about it. Yeah. So one thing I want to talk to you about is uh, we have a mutual friend who he shared with me uh, over over uh, breakfast one day. He said, "Steve, I want you to know in this next recession something's going to happen. I've been around for decades now, and so there's two things that happen. A your competition and wholesaling, they're gonna like a good chunk of them are gonna disappear. Yeah. That's not really a surprise, right? B, a good chunk of your guru friends are gonna disappear. I know who you're talking about who said that, John, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to get your perspective on this because I am looking around and the landscape has changed on the wholesaling side, but also on the education side mm -hmm. much faster than I had anticipated. Mm -hmm. So what is your perspective on all that? I 100% agree. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of one-trick ponies out there on the wholesaling side of things that learned one thing, one way, that basically on the wholesaling side, to my understanding, was go offer close to market value and then sell it to the uh, e-buyers, to the big e mm -hmm. hedge funds and so on. The hedge funds stopped buying. I, think, I understand they're starting to buy now again, but mm -hmm. uh, they stopped buying. And with that, they were like left stranded because with the pants down because they had no other way. They never learned any other additional skills to sell their property. They never built up a buyer's list. They never built up the network. They never built out any kind of other strategies to sell these properties. To. Yeah. So a lot of them disappeared and they're now struggling. Uh, uh, some of them have come to us and now learning land flipping because mm -hmm. obviously that's a strategy that continued to work. Uh, on the guru side of things, it's the exact same thing. I mean, is is there's a lot of wholesaling will never go away, but I've seen it since 2007. There was there was there was guys that were back then. It was short sales. Mm -hmm. Everyone and their brother started selling short sales. Well, all the short sale guys went out of the business, either mm -hmm. out of the business or they had to pivot. And all of a sudden, they became the wholesale guys. All of a sudden, they became the luxury home guys. All of a sudden, they became this guys. And and I I don't know how many times you can switch your career without mm -hmm. until you lose credibility on the market because mm -hmm. you cannot become the expert in five different things over the matter of seven years and become the world's most expert in those things because there's just not enough time to do enough deals of that kind to become the expert. So there's a lot of people that if you see that somebody switches gears from 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 one technique to the next mm -hmm. uh, year after year or every two years. That's a big alarm signal, unless, yeah. of course, they have such a huge organization or such a huge operation that they actually are doing everything, but nobody does that. So you're, 
having doubts that they've got the 10,000 hours of mastery every single hundred percent. You're in, you're yes. out. They got additional 10,000 hours of mastery in a different field. Yes. That's, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. So, um, so I agree with that. And, and you see that fallout happen. I mean, I've now, we have now been in the teaching industry since 2007. The, there is a handful of people that have been there in 2007 that I can think of. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is a completely different people. Yeah. So, so what yeah. are you doing? I guess, as far as, um, as, as a person with multiple businesses, mm-hmm. what are you doing right now to adjust in this market and what are your plans for the next 12 months? Okay. The nice part about land flipping is that we already went through a recession through it and, and we went through a brutal recession with it. Mm-hmm. 2008, when real estate prices in many markets fell by as much as 80%, 70, 80%, um, it, it took land with it, of course. Right? Yeah. And what we were able to realize in that time is, first of all, there was a little bit of what we call a time of a gap. And the gap is the time when the sellers still think we are pre-recession, so they want the high prices, and the buyers already realized we're post-recession or in the recession, and the buyers are now offering half price. It's always that way. It never seems like the yeah, it, never, it never works the other way around. Well, actually, unless there's a big, there's actually 2021 and 20 was a little bit like the price prices That's went true. up so fast that you could still buy in a month later. Like the longer you hold the property, the more money you make, right? Yeah. But um, but right now, this this is this this there was about a six month period in 2007. But an interesting thing happened is that there's two kinds of land. There's the big development land. And then there's the land that we're talking about, which is the infill lots, the, the, the privately owned smaller lots, not development land, but then also the recreational land, the land that the individual John Doe is interested in buying. The big industrial land is actually a leading indicator. Like the big builders, the big builders, they have a certain visibility, again, which I learned from Collective Genius, from one of the Frank Cava there who used to work for a, for a big builder. And he basically mm-hmm. says that... In 2006, when the market was still absolutely on fire, from one day to the next, they realized that their foot traffic on their model homes on, for these big developers went down by like 90%. There were auctions and people went crazy to buy these houses. And within literally a month, it went away. Mm-hmm. And, it was like, and, and that's when he knew that the real estate boom was over. And that's one of the reasons I'm part of a group like that, because when... When we were in this boom right now, I asked like, hey, who has connections to a builder? Why do you see foot traffic? Why do you see those things? Because that is a leading indicator. The moment, and the builders see that, and that's the moment they stop buying large tracts of land. Because they can tell like, okay, the boom is over. Let's stop because we're at the peak of the market. Let's not buy these pieces of land anymore. So the big multi-million dollar development land, they stop trading and that they stop moving six to 12 months before the world realizes that we're at the end of the boom. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, though, the land that we flip is a, is a lagging indicator because we're buying from the end buyer. We're, buy, we're selling, sorry. We're selling to the end buyer. And the end buyer only stops buying when he literally feels it in his own pocket. Mm-hmm. And they feel it in the pocket. Uh, usually there's a recession. Every employer holds on to their employees for as long as they can. And they're only going to let them go when they have to, which is usually about 9 to 12 months afterwards. So when the big recession happened, 2007, 8, the recession happened, but the big layoffs only started in 2008 and 9, mm-hmm. or like started a little bit later. So what happens is when people started getting laid off, that's when the buyer started pulling back. Right? So yes, did we have less buyers during that time? Yes. Yeah. Did prices fall? Yes, prices did fall. But we still had enough buyers to continue doing what we're doing because when you put properties under, under contract at 10 cents on a dollar, and before you were selling them at 65 cents on a dollar, but now price has gone down. You only have to sell them at 40 cents on a dollar. Life is still pretty good. Yeah, life is still So good. in essence, what we ended up doing, we ended up dropping our prices. Our margins got, got compressed. Instead of making $35,000 on a deal, we made only $15,000 on a deal. But we were able to stay in business very, very successfully. And then also more people want seller financing. So that was another effect. But then also what it meant after a little bit of adjustment, we just simply dropped our purchase prices. So instead of buying something for or putting on a contract for twenty thousand dollars and selling it for fifty, we would take a similar lot and now offer seven thousand dollars and sell it for twenty. Mm-hmm. Right? 
So still the same model continued working for us. That's why we don't really have to make many adjustments other than uh, we obviously are careful other than what we're seeing right now is that the trend goes again to a little bit more seller financing because the, the buyers as we potentially or already or who knows what kind of weirdest recession we've ever been in right now. The restaurants are full. The airlines are full. Everything is the malls full. Are full. The you malls can't park are full. Anywhere. But we're in a recession. So yeah. who, who, I, I haven't fully understood it yet. Yeah. But, but what we're seeing is just a little bit. There's a trend toward people being a little bit more cautious. And again, they're, they're wanting more seller financing. So our triple close comes in. So we're, what the way we're doing is we're pulling more land, more note buyers around us because a lot of our students have a ton of money. They like the notes. So we're, we're building up an, a bigger pool of note buyers around us so that we can do those more advanced creative finance triple closes where somebody buys a property, sells a property, and sells a note all in the same day. And that solves the problem for our students uh, very, very elegantly. So going back to, and, and that's very thorough, so going back to Jack, the individual, right? Because you're taking the, the, the money you're making here on the land side, the education side, and you're buying multifamily. What is your... Um, oh, can I say one extra thing? I forgot. Yes. Sorry. That, before I forget it, there's actually, there's another thing. I am 100% convinced that this time around, land will not see a recession. And the reason for that is very simply that there's two massive factors that did not exist last time around. Factor number one is 45, 48% of all Americans still work from home. Mm. That, that has given, that if you look at the numbers, we have 332 million Americans here, half of them work, it's 150 million, let's say, 160 million. Of those 45%, that's like roughly speaking 70 million people. So 70 million families, not all of them are, are can fully move around because one might be tied to a job, the other one mm. tied to a location, the other one not, but Tens of millions of people have now the ability to live where they want and work where they want. And not everyone wants to live in a cookie-cutter neighborhood. So there, there's a lot of people that came on the market. When COVID started, houses went on the market, like, went like this, but land did too, and land has not come down. Houses have come down, land has not come down, because we constantly see that the demand for people like, hey, I want to have those five acres out there. Yeah, I want to have this, this 20 acres out there. And then there's a the second thing. Uh, Skylink. Have you heard of Skylink? Or um, oh, you're talking about the internet from internet. Elon. Yeah, Elon Musk's yeah. Uh, network Starlink. of uh, Star Starlink. Yes, yeah, exactly. Starlink. Yeah. Did I say Skylink. I yeah. said Skylink. I meant Starlink. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes. Um, Star uh, Starlink. Um, Starlink. Right. Yes. I think yes. so. Let's get it right. Yeah, you're you're right. Starlink. The the internet. The the it's internet everywhere. company that now for the first time ever really. Uh, provides, it's still expensive, but it's affordable expensive. It's not thousands of dollars, it's, it's hundreds of dollars. Allows you to have internet in places that you never had internet before. So before moving, like anyone wanting to set up shop with an RV, with solar panels, with internet out two hours away from town was just impossible. You yeah. went there for the weekend, but you had to be back Sunday night because if you want to be on a conference call Monday morning, you couldn't. Now you can. You can be parking there. You set up your little mirror thing. You connect to, to all, all of these Starlink uh, servers, uh, like little satellites out in the world, and you have full-blown internet in the freaking middle of nowhere. That did not exist. Now you combine those things. Millions of people now have the ability to live where they want to live, and you have the ability to be wherever you want and have full-blown internet access. We have people now moving away from town and moving into rural areas and living that space life that they want. There's a Facebook group with over 400,000 people that all want to go back to the land. Really? But they don't want to all live off the land. They still want to have a computer job where they can be a programmer somewhere, but on five acres with some chickens and a cow and a goat. Right? Yeah. That's kind of their lifestyle. 400,000 people, and they all want to fulfill their, their dream of, uh, and their dream of uh, living off the grid in a way. Uh, somewhat off the grid, and they couldn't do it before. Mm -hmm. Now they can. Yeah, that's very. And these great. are big, huge demographic pushes and technology pushes that have come together that are pushing land more than we've ever seen before. So as a result, I'm 100% uh, sure that we are not seeing any. We're not going to see anything uh, in decline of values and decline of, uh, of of demand like houses has seen or houses sees every once in a while. Yeah, oh, that makes total sense. Uh, what adjustments are you making in buying multifamily right now with the environment that we're in? Oh, huge. 
uh, huge uh, things. Uh, first of all, um, I have left in a we're switching completely gear right now, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, in an environment that since 2016, when we went into multifamily, we spa we we bought really where the numbers made sense. Mm -hmm. We have left almost all the markets, the secondary and tertiary markets, because from what I understand, when the market comes down on multifamily, all but the primary markets, the top demand, the, the top, top markets in the country are being crushed. Mm -hmm. And not so much from a rental perspective, but yeah, rents go down and like in this tertiary, smaller cities. Uh, it's sexy while everyone is, uh, well, everything is sexy, but it's not when it's not, right? So we have sold our properties in Oklahoma City, a, a secondary market. We have sold properties in other markets, uh, very good at the height of the market. And right now we're only focusing on, on two cities, basically, or two markets. One is Florida, one is uh, Arizona, and a little bit of Texas. And only there the top markets, very simply because we're looking at demographic movements. Those are the mar markets where people are moving towards. And what you also see, unfortunately, through, due to high interest rates, and high cost of lending, unless you already started building new multifamily products, every building activity has stopped right now. Mm -hmm. Nobody's building. Nobody's getting the right loans. Nobody's, getting, um, no, nobody's willing to take those risks. Nobody knows what the environment is going to look like by the time that their project is done. So everyone has stopped. Well, that's, that's okay unless cities like Phoenix still getting... 75,000 people a year moving towards. Mm -hmm. If there's no building activity, what's that going to do to the rental prices? It's going to skyrocket. They're going to continue to go up. Yeah. So I'm only buying in Phoenix. I'm only buying in Tampa. This happened to be two markets that I really want. I'm only buying in a couple of other cities uh, of the United States because they all have that in common. Yeah. Everything else, I'm, I'm not buying in little town texas or something that has stagnating that was sexy for a little bit but has stagnating population growth no population growth because it's just not going to go anywhere so i'm very very careful with that we're modeling very very conservative we're only buying also a value add properties so in that environment we can't just rely on rents going up because of these demographic things something might stop that like another COVID for a little bit uh, but instead we're only also buying properties in those same environments that we can push the rents true active upgrade. So we bought 45 units. It's a smaller one. We typically like larger ones than that. 48, 45 units in Phoenix that is still on a boiler and chiller. Mm. Like boiler and chiller is basically there's one big air condition and one big heater for the entire property that's on their last leg. And we're converting everything in individual air condition units, uh, which allows us to, that alone allows us to raise rents by like 150 bucks. Gotcha. And things like that, plus... Uh, there's lots of things to do. So that's the thing. So it's a, it, we're in an environment where rents are going to go up. There's no other way. And on top of it, we have active ways to push rents even more. That makes us really secure and safe that we know, that we, know we can deliver a great return on our, on our investors' money because we have investors in that deal. But also we have put $800,000 of our own money into that own deal. Mm. So our, our, our deals, are, our in, interests are aligned 100% with our investors because if, if, if they lose, we lose. Right. right, we lose our own money, so we would never do that. So that's kind of the adjustments we do. We have left these tertiary markets. We underwrite extremely carefully, and we only go in markets that are that where we know there's pressure on their rents, as well as where we know that that we can that we can force appreciation already anyway. Yeah, oh, it makes total sense. Good to know. Uh, and I was asking that question selfishly for myself. Sure. Uh, so uh, Blade uh, on YouTube, I have sixty five thousand saved in a money market account. Where should I put it to grow it? Not in the money market account. <laughs> uh, I'm not a financial advisor. I, I like what Warren Buffett says, which is uh, diversification is stupid. Um, diversification ha has, is, an, is, a, is a passive strategy. It's a strategy to, risk, to minim mitigate risk. It's not a strategy to maximize growth. Right. So instead, he says like, uh, Warren Buffett has all his eggs in one basket, which is the stock market and companies. And he just watches that basket really, really closely. And he is also an expert at that basket. Mm -hmm. Every time I invest in the stock market, I lose money. 
Last time I invested was right before it tanked. Lost like, well, not that much, but I lost like probably 30 grand. Mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm just an idiot from the stock market. I just can't, can't figure that thing out. So what do I do? I focus what works for us every single time, real estate. Yeah. I'm good at it. I have now 22 years of experience on it. I know my, my lane, though. I have multifamily land. That's what we do. And some, some single families that we still hold. Right? But that's, that's, my, that's my jam. That's my thing. That's what I know inside out. And if somebody brings me a deal that's a RV park, it's like, great, I know nothing about it. No. Yeah. Like, it's just, um, so, so that's the thing. So in, if your industry, if you have 65K, you can invest it in yourself. You can invest it into land flipping. Make, please do me a favor, though, that if you do, you go all in. There's no such thing like trying. Because the word trying includes, includes the failure in it. Mm -hmm. Trying means, if you say the word try, I'll try this. What are you really saying? Like, I will give this a try, give this an attempt, but in the worst case, I can always revert back to what I'm already doing. That's not a, that's not a, that's not a method to success. That is a method for failure. If you say like, when you say, I'm going to use that money to invest in myself, to invest into the system, invest in the things, and come hell or high water, I'm going to make that work then you are going to reach out to your mentors, to your coaches, to your things until you figured it out. And then there's no more other strategy. And that's how, that's how you have succeeded. That's how we have succeeded. We don't, yeah. we, we don't set something up. Oh, let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. No. It's like I, I interviewed for my podcast. Uh, it's not yet released, the podcast. I interviewed two of our students that came into our program. They basically said, this, is, this makes sense. I can see how it works. And they spent the first six months right now putting every single system and automation in place gotten they have i think something like 10 deals under contract they haven't even sold a deal yet they're like we're not focusing on sales yet we're focusing on business systems and right now they hired a sales guy within the first three days he sold three properties so now they're optimizing the sales piece and their goal is to still do a million dollars a year this year they're going to be at a million dollars this year because they're setting up the right way but what i mean is the reason i interviewed them even though they're not yet making a million dollars is because the mindset that they came up with came into this, was this like, this, we're not trying this. We're going to take the money, a certain amount of money, we're going to invest it in optimizing every single part of the system, and then we're going to turn the flip, switch on, and we're going to go like boom mm. and start making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Yeah. And, I mean, not everyone can do that, but it shows that mindset of all in, yeah, not I'm, the mindset of like, yeah, let's try. Yeah, I'm committed. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, I want you to think about the last thoughts you want to leave, leave the listeners with. Uh, guys, if you got value today, please subscribe, right? Do not keep us a secret. Help us reach more people. Um, and uh, we do, again, have that announcement coming up a week from today, so keep an eye out on for that. And we got part of the disruption tomorrow, so definitely tune back in tomorrow. So what are some last thoughts you'd like to leave everybody with? Hmm. Uh, we talked about so many different things. It's like, it's like, it was a lot of fun. Um, the last thought I might have is since the questions we gotten were, were more questions from, from people that are like perhaps at the beginning part of their journey. Mm -hmm. um, what worked for us really, really well was particularly since I, at the beginning of the interview, I talked about us trying this and trying that and trying this and trying that. And then finally stumbling into something that worked for us. Um, the lesson I learned from that was that what worked really, really well for us is to take, start our journey, start your journey with something that you can, that you can wrap your arms around, that you can understand, and that is not so complicated that it doesn't, that it, that it demotivates you or that you can get burned with it and things like that. Because like that first house flip deal, like that first deal in, in the Garfield district, there was a triplex actually. If we would have done the next logical thing, which is to buy it ourselves and rehab it, with what I know today, I know we would have probably lost a hundred grand on that deal that we didn't even have. We would have had a, we would have lost a, just our shirts, and we probably would have been so much burned from that deal that we would have never touched real estate ever again. Instead, though, we backed out of the deal and we over multiple other hurdles came to land flipping and land flipping was so simple and was so low risk or no risk because even now in our contract, you can back out anytime for any reason. You have nothing at stake 
that we're like, okay, we can handle that. And even though we knew nothing about real estate, over those first 10, 20, 50, 100, by now 4,500 deals, we have learned so much about real estate that then the next step into single families and then the next step into multifamilies wasn't hard anymore. Mm -hmm. We started with something that we could understand as complete idiots and complete beginners early on. We could understand, we could implement, we could make money with. And then from there, now we're pulling, we're pulling off. We raised eight and a half million dollars for two apartment complex deals in the last three months. Wow! I would have never thought I would ever been able to do that. If somebody would have come to me with that deal, I would have been screaming and running the other way early on because it would have blown up my ability of understand even the slightest aspect of it. Because multifamily is very, very complicated. If you really go into the nitty gritty of it, particularly financials and things like that. There's ways to hide to hide all kinds of stuff in the financials. So you got to ease yourself into that. So I, I recommend if you're a beginning student, start with something that you can do. Start with something that is like, you know what? I understand it. I like it. I think I'll enjoy this. Let me go after that. And then build from there because you automatically will learn about title issues and title companies and financing and loans and all the stuff will come naturally. And Soon enough, you look back and you pull up that first notebook, that the first book that you ever had, and you'll be like smiling and endearingly, like kindly smiling on your old self by thinking like, oh my God, can't believe how little I knew back then and how much I have learned since then. You saw that book? Yeah. I think you should do a video about that. I should, yes. Yeah. I have it in my bookshelf. Yeah. yeah, perfect. All right, so if someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Well, very simply, I do my own social media, so you can send me a direct message on Facebook. It's Jack Bosch. You can send me a direct message on Instagram. It's Jack Bosch. Uh, you can send me, I don't even know what TikTok does it. I'm Jack Bosch on TikTok too. Uh, <laughs> you can do our, you can, you can, um, you can simply go to land, uh, land profit fun again. Um, you can, uh, that, that's probably the best ways. Or you can go to landprofitgenerator.com and there's a phone number. You can call our team and, and leave a message with them too. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having yeah. me. Thank you guys all for watching. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button and we'll see you guys tomorrow for part of the disruption. Shout out to Steve Train. Jump on the Steve Train. We real estate disruptors.